It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. I really don't need to say much about this show except tell you who's on. Brianna Wu is here. Alex is here. Alex Wilhelm from TechCrunch. Corey Doctorow of the EFF. And, of course, sci-fi novels galore. I think this is going to be an amazing show for you. We'll talk about Russia versus Ukraine, of course, why I can should not shut down the Russian Internet. An optimist's playbook for our clean energy future. We'll debate nuclear versus solar power. We'll talk about Elden Ring and chess and Audible Gate and the history of the Standard Oil Company and the <laughs> Carter phone decision. And, well, it's just a wide-ranging conversation, and I think you're going to love it. Stay tuned. Twit is next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Tech. Episode 865. Recorded Sunday, March 6th, 2022. Safety Orange. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Nareva. Traditional audio conferencing systems can entail lots of components. Installation can take days, and you might not get the mic coverage you need. That's complex expensive. But Nareva Audio? <laughs> easy to install, easy to manage, no technicians required, and you get true full room coverage. That's easy economical. Learn more at Nareva.com. And by Noom. Unlike other programs, Noom Weight uses a psychology-based approach to help people better understand their relationship with food and gives them the skills and knowledge they need to build long-lasting positive habits. Sign up for your trial at Noom.com slash twit. And by Podium. Join more than 100,000 businesses that already use Podium to streamline their customer interactions. Get started for free at Podium.com slash twit or sign up for a paid Podium account and get a free credit card reader. Restrictions apply. And by Linode. Get the cloud support experience you deserve with Linode. No tears, no handoffs. Get $100 in credit when you visit Linode.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Stand back, put on your thinking caps. This is going to be a powerhouse episode. Uh, Brianna Wu is back. Her voice is still a little gravelly, but you're feeling fine. You had some nodes removed from your larynx or something? I actually, I tore my vocal cords while I was running for Congress. I uh, gave so many speeches and spent so many hours on the phone uh, fundraising that um, I had pain when I would talk for a long period of time. You can actually listen to old uh, episodes of Twit and you'll hear towards the end. Yeah. I sound really, really Getting rough. rough. Yeah. And, um, you know, I went to an ENT and they're like, well, you've got this giant hole that you tore in your vocal <laughs> cords. So um, I had to go under like uh, full anesthesia. And they got a laser and just wow. uh, you know lasered it. It closed, but it's uh, it takes a while for the tissues to calm down after that. So but you're not I'm in just, any pain. Uh, you just sound, no, no, no. I feel you sound fun. like I Patty and like Selma. Smoke. But exactly. you don't. Yeah, you're not a heavy smoker. It's just uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway. Thanks great for to, having me back. Great though. to have yeah. you back. And people don't know, but uh, you were scheduled on Twitter a few weeks ago, and I actually mm -hmm. kicked you off. I was mean. <laughs> <laughs> saying I can't because your voice I, I sounded really bad I really did I just knew so. that anybody listening would would just be in pain for you yes and so 100%. I just didn't, I didn't want them to suffer but I think we can we'll be fine now anyway it's I needed you because I need intellectual heft and you'll see why <laughs> I'm all I'm bringing in all the top guns here Alex Wilhelm is here a, a humble reporter at TechCrunch hello Alex Hey, I just want to point out that I think for the first time on Twit, out of everyone on the panel, I have the least Twitter followers, and I'm peeved about that. <laughs> how many, well, just uh, you know, how many Twitter followers do you have? I don't know, like 92,000 or something. <laughs> Apparently it's not, not enough. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a, a babe in the woods compared to this crew. Like Corey's got like 430,000, Brianna's over 100. Leo's got like a billion, I don't know. Half million. Half the more That's, you get, the worse Twitter is. People don't understand this. Like, that's really, no, no, no. that's actually really true. Because uh, yeah. I talk to people who say, "Oh, I love Twitter." I'm going, "You do? It's awful." And I yeah. think it's because you're just—I'm too enmeshed in it, or something. 
Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan. Uh, and third party, the one we are gearing up our intellectual heft for, science fiction author, uh, EFF spokesperson, all ra- a man about town, Cory Doctorow, is also in the house. And it's so great to have you, Corey. Plural, pluralistic.net is your new website. Newish, new, new, you know. Two more. years old. Yeah, it feels new since the pandemic. But you got to show us this shirt. Tell us what yeah, you're wearing. Yeah, it, it's uh, oh, gosh, and I've just blanked on the creator's name, but I'll find it. It's uh, someone's grad project. It um, it confuses automatic license plate readers and reads as like twenty cars, uh, <laughs> but the license plates spell out uh, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and then they have very cleverly arranged it so and effects is here so that it says and EFF in the middle of your chest. It looks like so an it's EMF, a bit of EFF, EFF promo, gasoline. but it's not. It's a, That's it's right. a graduate and I, project. I should point out that I'm not an EFF spokesman. I am an EFF like special advisor, but uh, I think unless I say so, please don't assume I'm speaking ex cathedra on behalf of the EFF. Thank you for the correction. You, we you have were, people whose job that is. Yeah, but now now there's other people. Yeah. But, you, but definitely you're involved with the EFF. Yeah. 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 So before we years, start the 20 show, years last I, Thursday. Want, I, I wanted to tell a funny story before we start the show today. And I want to go back to the magical year. I think it was 2007, where my husband gets a call from Corey. And Corey asks him to do the cover to one of his books. So hmm. I sit there and I watch Frank painting this picture of Corey Dr. Oh, I head love it. Slowly being assembled by dinosaurs <laughs> week after week after week after week after week for Corey. It just gets weirder and weirder the further he goes. So then like uh, we're hanging out with Corey and Frank is like, hey, do you want to buy the original painting? And Corey's like, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> So that's the story oh, that. no, I think I said I want to I want to yes. raise money for it. I don't think there I said I don't want to own it. Oh, I mean, I so love funny. that work. Yes. Oh, it's great. I buy it? It's great. I'll buy it. How, Let's get no, the no, bidding I, up. I don't even I don't even know where it is. But I, it was like I think it. it's so I, it was at an auction. And I think Frank said, do you want to buy it before we put it up? Oh, oh that's right. It. You're right. Oh. And I said, no, we should auction it. Yeah. But I had to stare at pictures of your face as he was deciding how to paint it nonstop for so long. Oh. So it's weird seeing you in person today. My apologies. Having spent the last two years on Zoom, I know how horrible it is to look at my face no. all the time. <laughs> We all I've know never that had lower now. Lower self-esteem. Yeah, we all know what that's like now. Uh, we should also mention Corey's uh, book, "Unauthorized Bread," a radicalized novella, is going to be the subject of Stacy's next book club in our club Ooh, twit. Yeah. So that's cool. pretty cool uh, too. So it's it all, and it's being adapted for as a graphic novel by Jen oh. Doyle, and it'll be out, I think, next year. <gasps> How exciting! Yeah, from first second. That's really cool. Uh, what's your late most recent book? Uh, it's How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism. It's a short book about... <laughs> it's just a few pages. It doesn't take long. I have a copy over here. <laughs> Unionize uh, everything. Yeah. Yeah. And it's basically like uh, antitrust and interoperability. Uh, and, um, and you know, there's a whole bunch coming. I write when I'm anxious. So I have eight books coming up between now and the end of 2025. <laughs> COVID uh, is good for the... Uh, for the uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, next one, the next one's a um, cryptocurrency heist novel. Yeah. Uh, coming out from tour called red team blues at the start of 2023 cool how exciting actually the next next one is now that i think of it sorry there's another one in between there uh a book called choke point capitalism which i co-wrote with rebecca giblin uh which is about um creative labor markets and why just giving artists who are in highly concentrated markets more copyright won't get them paid anymore because the all that'll happen is that the people they're trying to sell their work through will just demand that they sign over whatever copyright you give them. It's like giving your bully kids more lunch money. Bullies just take that too. And we have like 20 proposals for really shovel ready stuff you can do that will actually put more money in artist pockets instead of giving them something else to complain about. Love that. Brianna and I were feeling bad because uh, both Corey and Alex have huge bookshelves loaded <laughs> with books behind them. There is a difference. Corey wrote all the books behind him. Uh, yeah, so, so there, there, there is a difference there. 
Uh, I mean, books books are like pubic lice or tribbles. You know, they just kind of accumulate. <laughs> they multiply. And they I agree. And, yeah, yeah. Maybe not like pubic lice, but okay. Yeah, I get the I get pubic the, tribbles. <laughs> I get the point. Just don't I, I have just don't the, feed them after midnight. That's all, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I I have gotten to the point when my spouse, whenever I get new books in the house, she just kind of looks at me like, "What is wrong with you? You are broken inside, sir." No, Stop you're this. not. You're <laughs> saving the not independent bookstore. You are doing a good thing. Does Providence still have bookstores? Yes, we do. We try to order through Books on the Square. Actually, now famous in Providence because when Kamala Harris came to town for like 14 minutes once, she did go to Books on the Square and they have a picture of all the books she bought because they were nice. so proud. Nice. So now my little Aww. bookstore was once famous. Nice. And we should nice. we should mention before the show we were talking about uh, I was lamenting the death of the independent podcast and Corey brought up the fact that BBC is taking all of its podcasts, which were Ooh. formerly open on RSS and putting them behind a sound wall, a, a, a pay kind of it's a paywall. Is that right? No, it's a reg wall. It's like it's a special app. It's basically it's basically like what Spotify has done. You don't have to pay. They, you can listen for no. free, but you do have to use their app. Yeah, you, you. So it's basically saying you have to fragment your listening across more and more apps, right. and they get Ugh. to control. Uh, this is how a, the app is presented. A bail it's like trend the, in podcasting. It really is. It's like if BBC TV could only be received on a special BBC television oh, and you had to have a different television for Sky, you know? Yeah, that'd be crazy. Uh, Ian Thompson, who's watching, and we'll actually be on Twitter in a few weeks, all credit Ooh. to Dr. O for calling out BBC Sounds Podcast. It's a shameful situation. He's a Brit. So, yes. As am I. Now, I thought I was going to ask, because, of course, the top story this week is all of uh, top stories are all about Ukraine. I, I seem to remember. Are you Russian or Ukrainian? Both. Both. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm Russo, Ukrainian, Polish, Belarusian and Romanian. But my passports are Canadian and British and I have a U.S. green card. But by heritage, <laughs> by heritage. Yeah. You're Eastern European. I guess really yeah. all, all of that is kind of a mishmash. Uh, and and formally, I guess I'm half Asian because my dad was born in Azerbaijan. Wow. But wow. Uh, of, of Russian parentage, okay. Russian and okay. Polo-Belarusian parent, parentage. Uh, when you're watching what's going on in Ukraine, uh, are you torn? <laughs> uh, no, well, no, I know what side I'm on. What's yeah. really awful is getting email from my family in St. Petersburg Ugh. who are terrified. Uh, yeah. and completely demoralized and also who've just had their savings wiped out uh, and who are looking at a politically destabilizing event that has no good result. Russia wins. It's terrible. Russia loses. It's terrible. Um, there, there is nothing good that will come of this for Russian people. It's already terrible for your family. Yeah. Um, it didn't take long. Uh, and of course, that's due to sanctions from the West. Um, and yet, uh, you know, I mean, we don't have much we can do about uh, snow. I don't think I, although I'm surprised by the number of people I hear saying, oh, we should definitely create a no fly zone over Ukraine as if yeah. that is not an action of war that would yeah, that's the, begin World we War need the three air battles between the U S and Russia. <laughs> yeah. That will, that will definitely, uh, calm the situation yeah. down. Yeah. I mean, you're right. I, you know, there's, um, there's an old joke from Ireland as opposed to an Irish joke, uh, an old joke from Ireland that whose punchline is if you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. And, you know, <laughs> like neoliberal shock th therapy after the wall came down, created the conditions that brought Putin to power, uh, the de decision to bring Putin into the world-based order because we wanted his, um, you know, his, his gas wealth, his fuel, his fossil fuel wealth, uh, increase the presence of oligarchs around the world and their corrupting influence and also made it harder to effectively sanction them because now the wealth is spread out everywhere. And, you know, there's just like a series of missteps and some things that weren't missteps and some things that are definitely the fault of Russian elites. And, you know, that uh, I'm not one of those people who says, well, it's definitely NATO's fault for, for showing up on Russia's doorstep, but that didn't help either. Right. Like I, I think you'd have to be a weirdo to say, no, no, no. One of the things that really stabilized that region was, was uh, bringing NATO up to the, the Russian border that, that definitely calmed things down a a lot, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a horrific situation and we are kind of like 20 years too late to have prevented it from happening. But, you know, as with trees, the best time to have planted a tree was 20 years ago. And the second best time is now. And the best time to actually confront 
some of the geopolitical choices that we've made that produce this outcome would have been when we were making them. And the second best time is right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, it's great in hindsight to say, well, this, you know, this was, could have been avoided, but I, uh, all of life is like that. I mean, you, you know, you, you do things 20 years ago that you had no idea would get you to be a, for instance, a podcaster in the mm. midst of the worst time ever for podcasting. <laughs> and if I had only thought uh, better 20 years ago, but it's, it's foolish to even say that because no, you I, know, no I want to quibble a little because I think that 20 years ago, a bunch of people did say this would happen, right? It wasn't like, you know, who did it, is- Richard Nixon of all people. Predicted this. That's that is not what I thought was going to come out of your face right there. That is not the two words I thought were coming. At all. all right, I'll bite. Why was it? Why did Nixon call this, or when did he call it? Uh, he wrote a book in ninety one. I'm going to see if I could find it. I I, I saw this uh, fleeting. Was the I, subtitle Noam Chomsky was right about everything? Yeah, or? no. <laughs> was this the one he wrote with Monica Crowley when he was trying to kind of let me see if I can his, uh, let me see if I can find this now because. Uh, I think I saw it uh, on Twitter, which means it's you know it's long gone down the stream. But uh, essentially, he predicted the rise of the oligarchs uh, uh, at, at the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, the Berlin Wall. I mean, it was that long ago, and he had a fairly similar chain of events to what you just described, Corey. Um, it doesn't you know look. Nixon probably had a pretty good handle on geopolitics and, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not surprised that he had some insight into that. Henry Kissinger probably did too. Doesn't make them wonderful people. Yes. Uh, (laughs) But uh, it's like caveat there. Yeah. (laughs) Like all those people who read cyberpunk novels and say, this sounds like a great idea. We should do this. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. You've missed the point. (laughs) Um, I, I do have to say, I, I really respect all the people on Twitter that, you know, over the course of getting their epidemiology degrees and becoming experts <laughs> in virology, have managed to get a war college and become It's amazing, experts isn't it? The on, experts, it's, yes. It's, yes. I really, I do, I, I don't disagree with the premise, Corey, that uh, we should have taken stronger actions over the last 20 years. I think there's a very strong argument that, generally speaking, uh, our strategy has been appeasement. At the same time, it's, you know, I I think you look at something like, I I just can't help but feel there's a large contingent on on Twitter that is, and and in the press overall, that's really minimizing the risk that a no-fly zone uh, would create if America got involved with uh, kind of reinforcing that. And I, I, just speaking for myself, Every time the subject of war in the United States comes up, people don't know this, but Mississippi, my home state, has more people serving per capita than any other state in America. I, like every other Mississippian, know plenty of people that served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I have specific friends that did not make it home. And it's it's really hard because I do agree that our strategy has been appeasement overall. At the same time, I'm freaking war weary. I mean, we look at the uh-huh. outcome of Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's really hard to see what concretely that we accomplished. And I just have to be honest and say, I read the New York Times, I read WSJ, I read Washington Post. And it just seems like an epic cluster in every way it could possibly be a cluster. Oh, you know, we are in vigorous agreement. I grew up in the anti-war movement. Uh you know, I was arrested for blockading an arms bazaar in Ottawa. I have uh, important feelings about why it shouldn't be easier to arrest people who are protesting in Ottawa. Uh, and um, I uh, I completely agree. No, the, the appeasement I'm talking about is doing things like saying, well, we should, we should bring Russia into the WTO, and then we should integrate its banking system with our banking system, and we yes. should allow reliance on Russian gas uh, to become significant uh, uh, factor in European politics. And uh, if we discover that all of our tax havens are being used by Russians to launder their money too, as opposed to just our own homegrown oligarchs, we should forbear from acting on it in order to protect our own homegrown oligarchs instead of using that as the basis for shutting down tax havens all over the world and ending the kind of financial secrecy that abets corruption so that we can strike at their oligarchs and ours at the same time. Here's, uh, I found the uh, tweet 
This is actually a, a <laughs> how many how many conversations have begun that way? I found the I, tweet. I like I like it. Richard Nixon's Twitter account. I think it's completely lit. His memes are so on point. Uh, <laughs> this is a when letter. he gets loaded and, and just starts like posting uh, excerpts from his like tapes of conversations. With his, Let me tell his, you, his of staff. <laughs> this is a letter you know? Nixon wrote to the first uh, George Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush in ninety one or ninety two, arguing. Uh, to put more money into aid for European, for Western liberalism, lowercase l. The West, Nixon says, has failed so far to seize the moment to shape the history of the next half century. If Yeltsin fails, the prospects for the next 50 years will turn grim. The Russian people will not, this is 91 he's writing, will not turn back to communism, but a new more dangerous despotism, despotism based on extremist Russian nationalism will take power. If the new despotism prevails, everything gains gained in the great peaceful revolution of 91 will be lost. War could break out in the former Soviet Union as the new despots use force to restore the, quote, historical borders of Russia, end quote. I, that was actually pretty, of course, even a broken clock's right twice a day, but that's pretty astute, actually. I think we could see that. And I think what Corey rightly points out is that there have been enormous financial incentives to kind of whitewash exactly. what was going on in Russia. Yeah. And it's amazing to watch Shell, kind of look Shell back Oil and go, oh. is still buying Russian gas. You know, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, no one looks to oil companies to be moral arbiters <laughs> of our time. Sure. <laughs> Let's move it to but, tech, though. We can certainly talk about what's going on in Ukraine in uh, a tech context. In fact, it's really interesting to see how, I mean, you're seeing uh, the. Ukrainian Vice Prime Minister Mikhailo Fedorov used Twitter. He's using Facebook to call on hackers to step forward and help the Ukrainians in the fight against Russia. Uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, all sorts of Bitcoin transfers, uh, cryptocurrency transfers uh, to Ukraine. It is a it is a, a war in a different era. One of the things people have been very worried about is cyber warfare. Uh, the fear that Russia would start to attack us uh, and that we would attack back. Uh, there was a report which has been denied by uh, uh, Biden's uh, team that he was offered some options to uh, bring cyber warfare uh, to Russia, take Russia off the Internet. In fact, some have suggested to ICANN that they remove Russia from the DNS uh, servers, which would effectively take it off the Internet. Um, it's a very different time even than 20 years ago. So I don't think that it's really true that removing uh, the root servers would take Russia off the internet. The way that the time to live on those 13 roots work is it would take about, uh, well, several days for that to happen and Russia could make accommodations, right? They could set up their own route of trust and they could, you know, with friendly, large friendly powers like China could figure out how to get around it. So I think mostly what it would do is just establish a future in which I can uh, had even less credibility than it does now than and is seen now. even more as an agent of, of American foreign policy than it is now, which, you know, to the extent that that's true, it's not great. And to the extent that it's perceived as true, I think that it exceeds the extent that it is true. It robs it of the credibility that we actually need in internet governance. So I, I'm kind of on the right side of this. Like if it gains you nothing and costs you a lot, you shouldn't do it. Symbolism just isn't worth it. Uh, I can't said our mission does not extend to taking punitive actions, issuing sanctions or restricting access against segments of the Internet, regardless of the provocations. I think that's fair. Uh, of course, it was Fedorov who asked I can to yeah. take take Russia off. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. If you're if you're like uh, if you're, you know, at the pointy end of a, of of a war of aggression obviously like the these fine distinctions are not the things that are top of mind i don't think we should blame them for it but i also think that one of our jobs as people who aren't in the fog of war is to um you know listen and then not paternalistically but but you know taking into account the factors that you get when you're not uh, in imminent danger try and think through some of the second order consequences and whether or not this is worth doing. And I say that as someone who wants freedom for Ukrainian people, an end to Russian aggression, the the Russian troops out of Ukraine, right? I, I just think that it's the wrong way to get that. I, I don't think it would get it, that. And I also think it would cost One of the lot. requests Fedorov made that was responded to was that Apple uh, and Google uh, remove their stores from Russia. And they did yep. shortly thereafter. Yep. Is that a bridge too far? I'm okay with that because they're not an NGO that is in charge of the internet. 
Right. Uh, I and you know I do think that there are some unexpected consequences. Like, you well, know, the, the, I think of your Russia, the, your your Russian relatives in Saint Petersburg. Yeah, uh, who and are the standard suffering. app. That, yeah, and, and and not just them, but like the standard app that's used in the region for uh, private communications is Signal, as Telegram rather, which has some deficits. Um, apparently, they do have end to end encryption for group chat, but like I I couldn't find it, and neither could some colleagues of mine at EFF. Well, it's also uh, we roll your own encryption. It's not it's not yeah. standard encryption. We just we just published a guide to using Telegram more safely uh, in in Russia and in Ukraine. One of the things that, or no, it isn't that they have end-to-end -end encryption, I beg your pardon. They say that they have disappearing messages for group chat, which we couldn't figure out how to turn on. Uh, and they say they turned it, they started it last summer. But, you know, one of the things that you really want if you're in a politically sensitive environment is the ability to have messages just delete themselves after a relatively short period of time. So that if you're forced to unlock your phone, as Russians are now being forced to do on the streets, on the streets, on the streets. That, that, that they're not exposed to that. And so, you know, if you if you can't sideload as you can't with, an, with iOS and you want to switch to something that does have better disappearing messages and end to end and other features that would help you not just protect yourself, but protect your counterparties, the other people you talk to, that's now beyond your grasp. And so it, it it's not without its costs. I, I'm, I think that I, I am more comfortable with cutting off the app stores, but you know, for the record, I also think that it's completely wrong that Apple won't let you sideload apps. So, you know, there you Amen. go. Preach. Yeah. I, I do think that if you look at the history of how you know, Putin rose to power in Russia, people don't know this, but, you know, he went to he had uh, when he first rose to power, he uh, had the television stations that were really not treating him very kindly. They actually had, a, you know, the scene in V for Vendetta with a puppet that's kind of mocking, uh, mocking the, the fictional president there. That actually happened to Putin in uh, in Russia. They had one of their television shows with a Putin puppet kind of mocking uh, him. And what ended up happening to the person in charge of that television station is they did what they do to many people. They're part of political opposition in Russia. They brought him forward and they charged him with crimes. And then as he's in jail, they went to him and said, look, if you hand over the television station to this person that's a lot more friendly to us, all of this is going to go away. So I think you can't look at the legacy of how you know, Putin rose to power in Russia and not understand that very tight control over state media is part of that. You know, For all the things we've critiqued uh, the internet for, Many times here on Twit, I do think that giving uh, people access to information is something the internet is obviously good for. So any move to kind of limit that, it just, uh, it, it feels... It feels like it's symbolic, but it also feels like it's going to aggravate problems more than it's going to actually solve it. Here's the video from uh, Kevin Rothrock tweeted of political uh, police officers in Moscow stopping people. This is a terrifying video to, to see their phones and read their messages um just a this is this is, i mean it's not new in in syria there were militia checkpoints that would force you to unlock your phone and look at your messages to figure out this who doesn't you're even alive look with. like a checkpoint it's just on the street as yeah. people are walking by and terrifying i mean just terrifying here's the um EFF uh, article that you uh, talked about uh, that yeah. you worked with uh, on with Eva Galperin. Or uh, Eva Eva wrote it. I didn't work on it. Okay. I just uh, wrote a Twitter thread about it. This okay. is Eva Galperin is uh, my my colleague. She's our head of uh, uh, security research. She's done uh, amazing work on uh, particularly on defending women who are being attacked with stalkerware. She's the reason that the app stores have removed stalkerware from their app stores now. Uh, and she's from the region. Uh, uh, you know, more, more, I believe she was actually born in Russia um, instead of like me, whose father was born in the region. And so she has a lot of family ties and she understands the local context pretty well. And she wrote that guide to using it more safely. Like it isn't, there is no, you know, absolutely safe way of doing it, but there are some things you should do. I mean, one of the risks to Ukrainians using uh, group chat and channels is uh, account takeovers, um, where, you know, the, one of the things that uh, Russia really perfected as part of their propaganda strategy under Surkov, who was, who was, um, Putin's, you know, sort of minister for information for a long time was, um, making it so that there was just so much wrong information flooding the zone that people gave up on knowing what was truthful altogether. Like Surkov for many years funded many opposition groups that were extremely effective at uh, raising um, 
uh, opposition to Putin. And then he announced after several years of this that some of the opposition groups that were opposing Putin were actually funded and controlled by him and didn't say which ones. So that uh, everyone who was in any opposition uh, group now did not know uh, whether they were on the right side. And the whole idea is to just make it so that you give up on knowing yeah. what is truthful. You just assume that it's unknowable. Some of like the strategy they've been using in the United States. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's a very nihilistic strategy. It is. Uh, well, the whole I thing mean, is I somewhat nihilistic. I mean, there's no, it's, there's no solution. There's no good solution, it seems. We don't want to go to war uh, against another nation with nukes. We don't. We Sanctions harm everybody. I mean, as you point out, if they had access to the App Store, they could download Signal. Instead, they've got to figure out how to use Telegram uh, securely. Um, yeah. it's, it doesn't seem like there's any good solution, especially it, it's, it, it, you know what this brought home to me? Um, I was watching a video of, I think it was a, a drug store in Los, in uh, Los Angeles where somebody just went behind the counter and started taking stuff. And they're like, what are you doing, dude? And they just took stuff and then he went and he left. And he's got a mask on. You can't, he didn't have a gun or anything. He didn't need to. He could just, he did be intimidated. And I realized how important norms are that we think. We sure. think we're safe. You know, we think, well, I've locked my door. I'm safe. No, that's a norm. It's easy to kick down a door or break the glass. And that's just a, that's just a statement. Don't come in, please. It's a norm. And we rely on norms. And when somebody like Putin is completely willing to bypass norms, we're like those drugstore clerks who go, I, I don't know what to do now. You, you, you don't have to the... kick down the door. Speaking of norms, there right? There you go. I mean, he's got a bump key in his hands. <laughs> spend, spend just, yeah, great, a rake. Spend five, ten minutes yeah. with some videos from the uh, tool, the open, totally it's just open organization. Lock locks are meaningless. Oh, locks. Yeah. 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 I would, so that's I would not quite where I thought we Hold on. Sorry, let me, let, on, please. Because I, I, I interrupted Brianna. You go and then we'll get Alex. <laughs> sure. I was just going to say, I'd love to know what y'all think of this. Um, I You were talking about sanctions, Leo. I had a tweak up fairly viral last week, and uh, I buy all of my knives through, uh, through Russia, actually. Um, it's this guy in Russia. He's a traditional blacksmith. And he, he goes through and he, he hammers the ingots by hand and, and refines it and carves the handle out with a, it's just an absolutely beautiful process. And, and his whole living is making these hand build knives and selling them on Etsy. And I got this really, really emotional um, uh, letter from him along with uh, all customers did uh, last week. And he was saying, look, I know what these sanctions that are about to be announced in Russia, that uh, my entire business that I built here is about to be absolutely destroyed and dismantled. You know, we, we, we get by on this, uh, on basically sales to the rest of the world. And, you know, he begged everybody to go ahead and place orders while they could so he would be able to basically use all of that money and uh, send basically a bunch of rations to the Ukraine. He talked about how he felt tremendous guilt uh, because one of his workers had actually supported, uh, even though he was a teenager, the annexation, annexation of Crimea uh, a few years ago. And, you know, just really, he talked about how he'd been arrested for that and how he himself expected to be arrested any any day now. And I wanted to know what y'all think. Like, how do we feel about, you know, companies like PayPal, like facilitating stuff with that C to kind of not get around these sanctions, but help, you know, the individual Russian people that are going to be inadvertently harmed by these sanctions, no matter how we do it. Like if these sanctions are going to be harsh enough to actually, you know, have consequences. Yeah. I don't know um, what the end game like is. Him are it, going to be it, maybe may, up. maybe yeah. uh, the oligarchs uh, finally get so upset about losing their yachts that they go take down Putin. I don't know. Yeah. And certainly yeah. your, your family in St. Petersburg isn't going to, Go out to uh, uh, Putin's Dasha and take him out. That's not that's not a viable yeah. option. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Alex. You 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 can respond to, if you want to Brianna, or you can say what you're going to say, and then we'll give you a chance to respond. To yeah. Brianna. Well, just going briefly back. I mean, you were talking about norms and their importance, and one thing that I that I've been thinking a lot about is kind of American political journalism in the era of Trump and how uh, norms based reporting standards uh, were shown to be complete crap. In, in the context of someone who was willing to break through all norms. And so yeah. we're not, in uh, fact, we're not in safe fact, in that the people either. who break the norms win 
Yes. Because we're so ill-prepared, we're so caught off guard. Uh, somebody like Trump, just, you know, nobody's stopping him. Uh, yeah. But but to what Brianna just said about um, sanctions and their impact and so forth, I, I, I the, the lens through which I'm trying to view individual decisions by companies and governments when it comes to sanctions is whom does it impact and then how much? And so in yeah. the case of the internet that Corey was talking about earlier, I, I agree with him. I don't think it would be useful to try to disconnect Russia from the internet because it would be ineffective and it would also harm individuals much more than the state. So that's kind of how I'm trying to think about what's effective versus what is essentially kind of political uh, greenwashing, but in a, in a political context versus a, uh, an ecological context. Something like Some EA say, saying no more Russian teams in our FIFA game. Yeah, I don't really care what, well, one, <laughs> EA is like the evil empire of the video game world. It's like, <laughs> good job, guys. You're slightly less evil this year. But like, uh, to me, that that's just um, posturing versus taking actual action. So the PayPal decision has much more weight to it, yeah. right? So that matters more, impacts more people, and, and therefore we should really think about it. Um, but just to make sure that I'm clear about this, uh, here for for Ukraine, for Ukraine opposed to Russia, get them out and so forth. So oh, I'm not think, trying to be sympathetic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's. Be honest. Uh, I don't think this needs to be said, but you know, believe me, if I could figure out how to get these lights to be, uh, you know, the right blue and gold, uh, I yeah. would. Uh, we're all <laughs> in favor in support of uh, Ukraine, but uh, it's also reasonable to say, you know, we're certainly there's this knee jerk reaction of let's just get these Ruskies, which comes very naturally to Americans anyway. But uh, let's also let's also try to do something that's effective. And I really wonder what is effective it, when you I, have a guy I, like Putin who doesn't really suffer any consequences. Again, I you know I would say that if you wanted to get there, I wouldn't start from here. You know, think about yeah. how. But many... that doesn't help, Corey. That means it's too. Well, late. I get it. I get it. But again, the right time to have done this was twenty years ago, and the second best time is now. And if you think about how many different regions domestically and abroad that pose these kind of chaotic problems for uh, a, a decent, caring, pluralistic, solidaristic society are also places whose economy is, de is, is defined by a hole in the ground surrounded by guns, which is, you know, oil, natural gas, uh, mineral extraction, and so on. You know, they're, they're, I think that there is a political... Um, current that runs through economies that are defined by extraction because they don't really need to have everybody kind of pulling their weight in order to enrich the richest people like you you don't need you know if you think about say finland right where where you know when they switched from from uh like a, a pretty you know rural uh, resource-based, low low intensity economy to a high tech economy, and Nokia went from making rubber boots to making phones. They suddenly, in order to like thrive as a nation, needed to have a lot of educated people who could who weren't just chasing their next meal and who could stop and think and be creative and do all that other stuff. Whereas if all you're doing is digging holes in the ground. Uh, and then uh, shooting anyone who comes too close to the hole while you get whatever was in the hole out again, you just don't need everybody to come along for the ride. Yeah. And, you know, there are exceptions, you know, Norway doesn't look like that. Scotland doesn't look like that, but the, the, at home and abroad, so many of our resource extraction regions are, are really politically sick and, you know, we're on the buy side of what they're selling, mm -hmm. right? The, mm -hmm. And so we have delayed a, a green transition, a renewable transition for a long time. It's been really bad news just for, you know, our children's future and our own future. But it's also been really bad news geopolitically, right? Like, yes. and, and it's not like it's a surprise that, you know, the Saudis aren't great uh, political allies to have. You know, uh, and and we could have we could have done something about the necessity of making Saudi Arabia happy 20 years ago. And we should have to save the planet, but also to, like, save our politics. Yeah. Corey, are you trying to say that a theocratic monarchy based on oil extraction <laughs> is not a stable form? Of I'm, I'm actually power? going in the other I'm going in the other direction. I'm saying the reason the theocratic monarchy was able to sustain itself yes. in that country 
is because all you need to do to make the, the yeah. base the base rich is to just suck black gold out of the ground and and sell it abroad. That yeah. it's not the, the like the, I'm saying that the theocratic mo monarchy is downstream of the oil pump, right? <laughs> yes, no, no. And, no, no. And I, that, I was just trying to make a joke. To be clear, sure, no, no. <laughs> and, you know, by the same token, just to be really clear, I think. Putin's style strongman politics are downstream of a of a of a an oil problem. economy too. Yeah. 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 This is why hey, I find I'm it super ironic. That, one, oh, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. please. I've um, been talking a lot. You go for it. No, no, you really haven't. Uh, I'll just go quickly. I, I just wanted to add on to what you were saying, Corey. I, I saw a stat that really, really surprised me coming out of Russia. And I think it's linked to those kinds of extraction economics that you were talking about. You know, Putin is currently 69. The average age that many Russian men live to is basically a little bit north of 60 which really surprised me. And a lot of Putin's base of power actually ends up being uh, women a little bit north of 55 because they look at Putin as somebody who will uh, basically uh, ensure stability, whereas you know their husbands or the society around them because of those extraction economies you know uh they fell into alcoholism or they didn't get health care and died of a preventable disease and you know it's that extraction economy has literally taken the stability of their their relationships and their lives away and i think that that's part of putin's success in staying in power is kind of reinforcing and saying look stay with me i will give you stability i have order you know, i will ensure your pension will stay in place so i think that that's kind of the flip side of this you know even today as we're recording this visa and mastercard have come out with some really really strict aggressive policies in regards to russia they're undoubtedly going to you know it's going to disrupt uh that kind of uh social order that is keeping him in power so i i do hope that maybe some of these actions by the tech companies can uh basically disrupt his his basis of uh support alex i think you're right that's stability. Oh. oh i beg your pardon yeah, alex go ahead alex. i'm sorry i forgot oh. you were in I'm, I'm trying to get this I, I, under this control the most i knew i wouldn't twit. be able to but i'm gonna try <laughs> alex no, no, no. In, in the old days twit was just shouting now everyone's like no please not you. no no please like i feel like the whole twit like uh like, like guest rotation is like uh, matured and we're all so nice now. um i'll just say that i that i was going to kind of go towards where brianna was going on, on the sanctions point and the the stability point and i do think that for the under 35s in Russia who were living in kind of a dual world of having access to Western technologies and so forth and media and kind of, and then now kind of being shown the other side of the coin and what happens with their, their stagnant leadership, I, I think it does destroy the myth. And so I wonder if some of the dynamics that she was discussing uh, will become unspooled by what's going on today. And that's why I am not trying to say, you know, no to sanctions, no to um, aggressive corporate actions, just let's make sure that they're targeted at what matters versus just kind of uh, what looks good on Twitter. There's so a fairly brief period, though, in Russian, uh, and I'm no expert on this. It strikes me there's a very brief period in Russian history, going back 500 years, where you, ha where the normal person has had any say in what's going on, has had any prosperity. Even after uh, the, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, there was at least a decade of intense poverty and uh, and difficulty. I remember being in St. Petersburg talking to somebody saying, you know, it wasn't so bad when I didn't have to worry about the rent. Uh, you know, I, yeah, sure. I couldn't, I had no choices about my work or anything, but at least I didn't have to pay the rent and, you know, pay, stuff was provided for me. I think there is some nostalgia for the Soviet state. It's only a brief period of time. And then my wife was saying, well, okay, pre-Soviets, what was it? It was, it was the czars. It was, it was serfdom. There's only, yeah. there hasn't been a long history of, uh, of people being able to live their lives, uh, without being under the boot, uh, in, and in, in Russia. And, you know, in that period of, of kind of neoliberal shock therapy after the wall came down, the mortality among men was so high, uh, you know, uh, working age men was so high and it was mostly alcohol and violence related. It's really hard to overstate how destabilized the country became. And of course, there have been multiple crashes of the ruble as well. So whatever wealth people did manage to save was wiped out repeatedly. And then there was just rampant gangsterism. So my great uncle and aunt, my great uncle ran, um, was the curator of the Popov Museum, which was the, it's the equivalent of the Computer History Museum. And they got a little money from my grandmother and opened a dry cleaner. And uh, one day they literally got a phone call from a guy who said, hi, this is the crime gang, the mafia. Uh, your location is very good. 
uh, it's now ours. And if you ever show up there again, we'll murder you. Wow. And then they didn't have it anymore. Wow. Right. And so that kind of instability, uh, combined with, you know, massive wipeouts of, of whatever wealth you saved and, uh, completely, um, uh, you know, unstable and and uh, uh, unreliable pension system really, I mean, has people in a in a bad place. And you know, it is one of the things that paves the way, I think, for strongman politics. You can see parallels to uh, the rise of Trump and people's concern about instability and and uh, the insufficiency of the social safety net and just feeling insecure and it's feeling a, like their a, kids and their own lives are bad. And you it's know? a vicious circle. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. once the rule of law starts to fail, it fails fast and be, people become, it, it's, it's a terrible vicious circle. And uh, that's why it's so important that we have this sense of uh, fairness and of uh, the impartiality of the courts and all this stuff. And when you start to undermine that, it's all downhill from there. So I, I want to th throw another concept yeah. here, which is living standards. And uh, I'm thinking about um, the United States into the, the Trump era, if you will, as Corey just pointed out, Russia into this current era, and then also China in the last 15, 20 years. Um, what happens when living standards start to plateau? It does seem to be that you end up with a strong man type person, either getting to power or taking advantage of it to try to distract from what's going on. And so we've seen uh, an enormous crackdown in China in the last couple of years as they're dealing with population issues and a lot of other problems as well. Russia kind of capped out because their oil economy didn't have legs to grow forever. And so now we're here having Putin kind of shake things up. And then we had Trump in the United States based on what Corey pointed out earlier. So there's a, there's parallels here that we should have probably been paying more it's attention to. It's happening globally. Absolutely. Yeah. It's happening uh, all over the well, world. Uh, it's and I would say, I would, I would tweak, Alex, your, your formulation there and say that- Please. Where you have systems that are um, parochial and, and aren't interested in, in the common public good, but just in the good of, of elites, what you end up having is you have these windows in which you are generating wealth and in which your you know money is coming in be from your oil or whatever. But instead of reinvesting it in capacity, right, instead of turning Nokia from a rubber boot company into a phone company, you're just letting billionaires buy yachts with it, which when the oil runs yes. out... Yeah. You know, and that I think like Brunei would be a really good example of this, right? Where the the Sultan like at one point owned an aircraft carrier with 150 supercars on it that all rusted out because he forgot that if you put all your cars out to sea that they'll all rust to nothing, you know? <laughs> he never lived in Boston, apparently. He would have learned something about salt. <laughs> but, um, but, but there is yeah. a positive note here, which uh, I mean, if, if anything positive comes out of this, it does, and some have said Putin has awakened Western liberalism with a lowercase l, which he had yeah. uh, already said was uh, was dead. Trump mistook that for something else, but we'll, that's another story. And and maybe we will adjust our energy policy. This might be a, an opportunity for us to say, hey, yeah, maybe that was a bad idea funding uh, all these holes in the ground. Maybe we should look at renewables. You know, maybe we'll do it for the strategic purpose of not being dependent on others for whatever reason. Maybe there'll be a positive outcome yeah. to this. Leo, yes. can, I, can yeah. I ask a question about this? Uh, Brianna and Corey, and Leo, I'm going to get everyone's view on this. Uh, nuclear power, where do we stand on that? Because I'm on the pro <laughs> camp, but I do understand that amongst um, our team, there is a dissension in the ranks. So I'm curious where we stand on that, because I'm really pissed off that people are like, oh, oil is a problem in Russia. Let's drill more oil. Are, are we going to do US. Israel after this? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna stay first. I'm going to it. I'm going to it. Uh, all you have to do is look at that fire in Ukraine that almost created another Chernobyl to know that nuclear power is not designed to survive everything. Okay. Problem number one. Second, we get a huge amount of power from the sun every day. There are very good technologies for c converting that into every bit of energy we will ever need. I don't think there's any reason to flirt with something that is potentially dangerous when there is so there are so many good choices in renewable energy right now. I understand nuclear has the one benefit of zero emissions, but I don't think that makes it the the right way to go. That's just me. Talk me out of it. That's fine. I, okay. I'm not so, the smartest guy on this panel by any means. We have one pro from me and one uh, con or one negative from, from Leo. So Corey, Brianna, what have we got? I'll, I'll go after. Anyone want to grab that hot yeah. potato? 
I, I'm generally pro. I think that, um, yeah, one of the things I saw running from Congress is I was really surprised that there were a contingent of people that were really, really, really anti-nuclear power, uh, just, just as a blanket statement and would not vote uh, here in Boston based on any other issue. And, you know, to me, I think if you really dr- drill deeply on energy policy, all of it except for renewables gets really, really messy very, very quickly. Uh, do you know who's opposed to fracking in a really aggressive way? Putin, because so, so much of the, the it undermines his ga- natural gets. gas money. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I think the reality is sometimes when we talk about politics, we want to wave our magic wand and pretend we can create these systems from the from the ground up. I think rather than that, it's a series of singles and doubles that kind of move us in the policy direction that we want to go. So to me, the question is, you know, like here in Massachusetts, we use a ton of natural gas to heat our homes. Would moving to something like nuclear be, uh, be a step forward from an emission standpoint? I think so. So I'm in favor of anything that moves us in that direction. Though, obviously, as Leo was pointing out, a pure green energy policy would be much better. That was great. So, uh, have you ever run for office, Brianna? Because- <laughs> yes, I have. Yes, I have. You had that off the, had that off the, Corey, sorry, go to you. Yeah, I guess I would say that um, uh, I feel a lot, uh, I feel a lot the same about nuclear as I do about GMOs in that I, I don't see anything wrong with the, I, I don't think that it's um, insurmountable to build a system to manage and regulate them safely. I just don't trust the system we have to manage and regulate it safely. And in part, it's about, uh, in the case of nuclear, about the actual history of nuclear. Like, so the, the recent and long run history of how nuclear yeah. is managed. All you have to look Where, at Three Mile Island, Fuk- Fukushima, or, Fukushima or, which are, or Chernobyl and say, oh yeah, this is a good thing. Let's do more of that. There's there's a lot of like privatized uh, privatized gains and socialized losses in nuclear power, and there's and, and there's a lot of too big to fail. Like let's not, um, you know, where inspectors are kind of suborned because that that you can't you're not so running the new. Would you be in favor of it if it were a perfect system? <laughs> so if if the yeah if it were perfect, sure. I mean, I'll say this. If you believe in carbon sequestration, which I don't, I think that it's no, um, a pipe dream. Yeah. But if you do believe in carbon se- sequestration, you should believe in in nuclear power, at least as far as the waste is concerned, because carbon sequestration means uh, storing billions of tons of something for as long as we would have to store like swimming pools worth of nuclear waste. And so if you think we can do one, then you, you necessarily think you, we can do the other. Um, There's a book uh, by David Kay called uh, Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which is um, it's not a popular science book. It's a popular engineering book. So it presents all of these things as engineering uh, parameters, like here are the number of photons that strike the earth every day. That is your maximum theoretical solar budget, right? Here are the ergs exerted by the uh, moon on the earth. That is your maximum tidal budget. And then here's how much carbon we think we can have. And here's what we think happens with each half degree and how much carbon gets you. And like, here is the most theoretically perfect airplane uh, and how much energy it needs and so on. He's like, you just need to move the sliders around. You have to decide what your priorities are. And then you come out with an answer. Is it conceivable you could do it with just the, uh, with renewables entirely? So I'll sh- I'm going to paste a link into the chat. Maybe you guys can put it up here. Saul I Griffith, will. who's you know a lovely chap, he's he won the MacArthur Prize. Uh, he wrote a book called Electrify that came out last year about a clean energy transition. And he, although he favors nuclear, he says that um, it's politically too hard to to make happen, and so we should do a green energy transition without it. And then he says it's possible. So he says it would be easier with with nuclear, except for the political hurdles. And he says that, you know, as between like convincing people that they're wrong about nuclear and saving the planet from catching fire, we should just focus on saving the planet. And we don't need to convince people about nuclear to save the planet. So it's a it's a very, very good book. What's the name of it again? It's called Electrify, an optimist play, playbook for our clean energy future. And I, I paste it into the chat. I don't know if you can get that. Which from chat there did you paste it into? The Zoom chat. No, the here. Zoom chat. I have no access to that. Uh, <laughs> paste okay. it I can't see it either. I, I, IRC, IRC is the only chat you could uh, paste to. But, uh, but I can I can find it. Uh, that's fine because you can. I'll, I'll tweet it. To, I'll just tweet, tweet it. <laughs> it with, uh, now, we've, now we're reduced to tweeting. This is it. It's and over. It's like at Twit Live, right? <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna take a break and uh, and we'll figure it out. But we will post, uh, we'll post it in the show notes anyway. 
I am so thrilled to have you guys. There's still lots more to talk about. In fact, we've really barely scratched the surface. But this was a great conversation. And actually something that I've been trying to understand myself, so I'm glad we could talk about this. Uh, Corey Doctorow is here. Uh, his, uh, his website, you've got to subscribe to his newsletter, pluralistic.net. It's a lot of fun. It's great Thank reading. You. At Dr. Rowe on the Twitter. Uh, Alex uh, Wilhelm from TechCrunch, at Alex on the Twitter. And, uh, of course, Brianna Wu, who's no longer Space Cat Gal. She's actually using her name on the Twitter like a grown-up. Executive Director of RebellionPack.com. Elden Ring Speedrunner. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Uh, our show today brought to you by Nareva. We're getting back to work. It's so cool. In fact, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have an all-in-studio twit for the first time in, I think, a couple of years. Maybe you're starting to get back to work. You've got your your video conferencing room, but there's still some concerns. You, you want to have good audio for your conferencing because there's still some people working from home, probably always will be. Uh, maybe you still want to have some social distancing. So you could put in a traditional conferencing system. First of all, hugely expensive. Why is it expensive? Well, you got to have, you got to design it. You got to bring in engineers to measure and design it. There's all these mics and speakers. You got to put in DSPs. It is a complicated thing to do a traditional conferencing room. And by the way, even after you install it, it costs you because you've got to have it recalibrated all the time. Uh, look, the industry's been ready for some time for a better way of doing your conferencing, a better way of audio and conferencing, and that's Nareva. Nareva created the revolutionary microphone mist technology. It's, it's like a sound bar. In fact, you can see it on the screen if you're watching the video. It looks like a sound bar. It's got one or two uh, integrated microphones and speaker bars. Uh, you put in one or two integrated microphone and speaker bars in a room, depending on the size of the room. And then the microphone mist technology fills that room with virtual microphones, thousands of them, which means there's no dead zone. You can face any way you want. Everyone can be heard clearly everywhere in the room. Meeting and class participants just talk, move naturally, socially distance if they want. There's no microphones to clean, no wires. Everybody's hearing everybody. It actually transforms the conference call. And thanks to continuous auto calibration, your rooms are always ready with optimized audio. Nobody has to come in with a decibel meter and measure or anything. And the installation, you could do it yourself if you wanted to. It's a 30-minute DIY job. If you ever put in a sound bar, it's that easy. That means big savings on time and cost. We just have Burke do it. That's, that's all. And the management, you'll love this. Uh, your IT department will love it anyway. You get an Areva console, which gives you the power to monitor, manage, and adjust the system uh, anywhere, you don't have to go to the room, you don't have to go from room to room. So if you have many rooms, this IT will love it. Look, ask yourself, do you want to go with that old school system that really doesn't work that well and is very inflexible? Or do you want to try something modern? Do you want to go with a costly, complicated, traditional system or make the leap to simple and economical? You got to take a look at Nareva. Save money, get better sound. Everybody's happier. N U R E V A Nareva dot com. It's so easy to do. Go look at the website. You'll see Nareva. We thank Nareva so much for supporting uh, our show this week in tech. Nareva dot com. I was uh, I was telling you before the show, Brian. I I wanted, wandered into uh, Michael, our nineteen year old's game room and he's playing Elden Ring I'm on the PlayStation 5. I'm looking at it and I go, oh, is that Elden Ring? He said, yeah. I said, have you beat the boss? He said, no. <laughs> but he's played all the Dark Souls games. So I know he's really, really good at that. I set it up on my system. <laughs> I, didn't even, I, didn't, I didn't even get past the character design stage because it, it wants you to use one of those things that kids use controllers to, to play, controller is that what they call it to play the I game i believe so it's just it's all thumbs i can't i don't want i want to use a keyboard and a mouse like a human being <laughs> wow look i don't, I don't <laughs> look, judge look, metal look. there oh my goodness <laughs> All right, look, Brianna, I know in the background of your shot, there are a, a, a number of a classic gaming consoles. I think I can see them. Yeah, there's like an SNES there, That's correct. I think. Or, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I respect that. But Pay no attention was, to the uh, shark coming over the sofa, though. That's not part of it. I'm trying to be That's very focused on shark. That's Sharko. <laughs> 
I'm just saying that everyone knows that uh, controller complexity matters for in-game kind of control. And um, yeah. I have a PlayStation and I have a, an Xbox and uh, they're both fine. But when it comes to granularity- You need a keyboard. Per- Thank you, you very much. You need a keyboard. Yes. And also, if you want to aim- a mouse is great. And yeah. so uh, to me, we've already invented the wheel and everyone's trying to make crappy kind of like uh, worse wheels and uh, I'm not here for it. So Dark I think Souls play- is at its heart a console game. I think that's really the truth of it. Yeah, I think, I mean, if you're playing an FPS, I'm 100% there with you. Like that should be keyboard and mouse native. It's just, I put so many hours into this and I'm trying to- <laughs> Are you going to speed I- run, it, run it? Are you going to- I know oh, you're hundred percent. Are you really? I'm, yeah. It, it, once I figure out how to break How many it, years just, is it going to take you? <laughs> oh no. You figure out the exploits. Someone right now is figuring out some luck stat booster that will let you one shot everyone in the game. I'm just going to let them figure it out. <laughs> is that no, cuphead running behind you? What is no, it? this is, this is dark stalkers. So that's a very famous uh, oh, CPS, okay. uh, CPS two Capcom game. It's from oh, yeah, the see, Capcom. PGA yeah, yeah, mister. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Uh, I don't know if you know, this is field programmable gate array. They've actually figured out how to accurately uh, recreate the uh, original arcade hardware on a little $300 nice. box. But nice. no, I was just, I was just going to say, I don't think that I, I'm, I'm open to alternate kinds of input. I just don't think that would be ideal for this particular game because it's not about precision aiming. Yeah, yeah. It's about precision timing. It's like roll, duck and roll and jump and yeah. all that stuff yeah. at the right time. Yeah. Because right. the, the bosses have their rhythm and you have to understand and interact with the rhythm. It's basically or guitar. Hero. Over it's guitar it. hero for video games. <laughs> right. By the right way, on. here's here's the book Electrify by Saul Griffith. It's at MIT uh, uh, press an optimist playbook for our clean energy future, and I will absolutely um, buy a copy. And I hope that uh, the people in the corridors of power read it. I despair, frankly, since they seem to be more interested in nitpicking over ridiculous issues like oh, I don't even want to bring it up. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Seuss. Uh, like Dr. Before, Seuss. <laughs> before we get on to serious things, can, can we stay on Elden Ring for one second? Yes, please. No, now. hey, All right. never say, let it be said, Elden Ring is not serious. Look, I'm, I'm a gamer, big fan. I'm mostly yeah. a strategy um, computer or PC guy, but like I have consoles. So, uh, Brianna, question. I, I have the, the littler Xbox, the new one, the white one, Ooh. the not, not, not the good one because no one has them. And right. Can I play Elden Ring on the, the crappier current Xbox? 100%. Don't even stress okay. it. It's not, it, this is not a game where you're like graphically, I understand it's impressive. That's not the point of the game. Just prioritize it for frame rate. You're going to have a great experience. It's from a person with a 1992 Capcom game running in a track <laughs> mode on her TV behind her. Okay, for Pretty enormous television, by the way. That thing's the size of like my apartment in San Francisco. I, I live with a very, very, very serious gamer. My my wife used to play Quake for England. And uh, <laughs> really, that's the coolest there, thing I've heard. There was me. an English that team. There awesome. was an Eng- all England. Oh yeah, Quake. she toured the world. Uh, wow. So she has fallen down the back for blood rabbit hole. Uh, it's Ooh. left for dead, but harder. Ooh. And she's got a crew of three friends that she plays with. And she just, she, she plays with a headset, but she just screams into the headset, you know, encouragement and curses and whatever it takes over our living room every night. And it's how she's been socializing. She's really uh, very good at it, as you would imagine, but it, it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I don't know that I would ever actually play it, but speaking of someone with a lot of experience watching someone else play a lot of video games, uh, I give it I give it top marks. Actually, that's uh, a question we've been asking of late: is uh, why hasn't esports taken off, especially during this time of COVID? Ah. And, and and when will there be when will there be that game that everybody wants to watch? Uh, maybe it's Back for Blood. The neat thing about these uh, zombie games is the co-op mode, right? You're playing with a group of other people. You're doing it together. You're living through this uh, experience together. She's playing with people who are not uh, in the room, right? They're yeah, yeah. She's playing against friends who are but remote. But it's co-op. It's uh, yeah. I mean, I think this is. I I think that's a good start towards a game that you'd want to watch. There's a team. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so Leo, sure. on your on your esports point, I think we've already reached the point of kind of esports maturity because one thing people kind of forget is how old League of Legends is now. League of Legends is a game that I played in college, and now I'm going bald. So like it's been around for a minute, <laughs> and um, and the, the way the way that I think about it is it's kind of like the NBA. 
Like the NBA is an enormous deal. I have friends who watch basketball religiously. I'm on group chats with them. They send memes that make no sense to me and they're rabid fans about it. And if you don't watch basketball, you have no idea. And so, right. but yeah, it's kind of established. Some people know about it, but like no one watches it. If you don't no, know if basketball. you had, if you had, to, if somebody had to sit down and explain the rules of baseball to you. Three oh hours gosh. later, you'd stand up befuddled and say, well, I don't know why anybody watches that game. I feel that way about cricket. I'm sure your wife doesn't, yes. Corey. But, uh, yeah, it's she's not a cricketer. But but <laughs> I just had to explain baseball to my daughter, who was born and raised in the UK and moved here when she was seven, and just never had anyone explain baseball to her. And she came home from like Target with a plastic baseball bat and a ball and said, let's go hit it out in the backyard. And I was like, OK, do you know how to play? Like, do you know? She was like, OK, here are the bases. And I'm like, OK, explain how the bases work. She's like, I'm not sure. Here's what an out is you know and it was it was pretty fun oh, actually yeah. it's like me in a wicket i don't understand yeah yeah and, and i it's, really I don't think, understand a yeah. game that could go on for days <laughs> it's beyond beyond me so i think if you're looking at uh you know the most serious esports which would be fighting games you know we've had fighting game community since you know 1992 and street fighter but do, 2 coming but, out but do people watch it like would they sit in an arena and well, this it. is this is kind of my point that if you look at fighting games, the problem with fighting games is they've gotten more and more and more complex over the years. And if you ever watch an esports uh, broadcast of Evo, which is essentially the, you know, it's the Super Bowl of fighting games. It's like who's the best player that year. You almost have to have a PhD in fighting games to understand uh. what they're talking about when it comes to like frame advantage and things like that. One of the things on Twitch that I think uh, esports have really missed the bar on is that the most popular people that stream games on Twitch are very interesting personalities. So it tends to be less about this very, very high level play. And it's more about these interesting personalities or you know, girls in hot tubs in some cases, but more about the people that are actually bringing you the content. So, so that's one um, form of esports yeah. would be Twitch or the Let's Play content on YouTube. That kind right. of stuff. Here's a picture of Evo being played in front of a live audience Right. For some reason, this to me seems more like what it, you know, in an arena, what an esports. Yeah. But I guess it doesn't have to be that way, does it? I mean, we wa by far more NFL hours are watched, spent watching the NFL on at home on on a screen. In, in, but the in difference person. in the NFL and Evo is like Evo just had to be acquired by Sony because it it's not doing super well financially, right? Fighting games have gotten so insular with the skills it takes that's, to play them successfully. That's the yeah. problem I think with esports in general is it's so stratified. It's so niche yep. oriented. Uh, it looks like the MOBA games like uh, League of Legends or Dota 2 seem to have a very they seem to be well suited to esports I guess because you have teams who can compete and you can see the teams and you can have personalities. Right. But that's I think thing. it's stratified. It's both together. Yeah. Oh, sorry Leo. Well, I just I think that that's the problem with the gaming in general is that the console gamers, you know, the keyboard guys don't like the what do they call those controllers? Is that what they call them? <laughs> Handsets. I'm, okay, but like think about it this way. Is it, like, but the, isn't the, this the, the, the? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just, I, I was going to say, just isn't this the the normal um, life cycle of a game? Like I'm just thinking of Dungeons and Dragons, right? Which just went through this, you know, period of of increasing complexity, increasing complexity, and then a kind of collapse. Uh, when they refactored the rules because they just realized that it's too hard. you had to, yeah. the only way to be a D&D &D player was to have been a D&D &D player for 20 years. <laughs> right. And they, they, they were starving their pipeline. And I just wonder if that's not, uh, you know, in the nature of, of all of this stuff that it just gets more esoteric. A bit like, you know, if uh, snowflakes are falling down on a, on a snowbank, you know, little bits of complexity and each snowflake is no big deal, but eventually the whole thing becomes so unstable that you have an avalanche and then you get a new stable configuration in the form of something very simple again, you know? So here's the here's the counter argument. Chess hasn't changed in a thousand years. You don't play three-dimensional battle chess? <laughs> okay, I take I it mean, back. I have. <laughs> no, that wasn't I good. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> some games have, uh, I, I don't know because they're perfect or what, but they... Uh, it's interesting. I thought chess was going to be over 20 years ago when a computer beat the world champion. Shortly thereafter, there were, there it was easy to find on your phone a chess game that no human could beat. I mean, it's really right. gotten to that point. There are now just, you know, chess games with ratings well over 3000 and no human is that high. 
even Magnus Carlsen. So, uh, and that has not killed the game, interestingly. We found a way to coexist with the robots. We let them coach us and we work with them. Yeah. I think that's closer to like Super Mario, the original SS, SMB on NES. You know, like this is a good game, but it's still religiously played today by speedrunners because of the historical importance. Yeah, but you made it a new game with yeah. the speedrunning, right? That's a different hundred percent. Yeah. 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 So you're playing and the I, same game, but it's a different goal. I think that in chess, what has happened, I'm not I'm not a chess expert, but I what I've heard has happened in chess is there is a new kind of play, which is when a human and a, and a, a machine learning system play against another human in a machine learning system. They call it the centaur play, you know, where you're half person, half machine. And that that apparently makes for a really challenging and interesting game. That's it. I, I have not seen that. I mean, you know, I, we just had the World Chess Championship, which was between two humans. Uh, a couple mm. of months ago, and that was played so... In fact, there's very strict rules, and it's a real problem in chess of cheating where the guy goes up and goes to the bathroom and looks at his phone and then comes back and plays. <laughs> but uh, uh, So there have very strict rules to, to prevent that from happening. Nevertheless, a lot of the preparation, almost all the preparation, and uh, a, a German play and stuff is done with the kind of human-machine mm. interface. The machines are very, very good at finding the best move, but it's not often not it's often not an intuitive move or a move a human would make it's mm -hmm. it's really interesting actually to watch this happen uh it might give us some insight into what the future holds for ai in general and an ai human interaction in general it's yeah. interesting i think magnus carlson though with his excellent hair has also he does have very chest. good hair yeah 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 no uh, kind of kind of a boost much better will, than any brought... computer yeah yeah, no computer has ever had good hair in the history of computers. Um, but he brought personality, brought pizzazz to it, if you will, and I think that's helped chess grow because personalities <laughs> combined with no, no, hear me out. Personalities combined with skill-based sport are what drives. Uh, ah, league you're exactly right. Up, and critically, the NFL the, has the had up that. close and personal is the phrase. It's how they make the Olympics at all interesting, especially the Winter Olympics, where there's not head-to-head -head competition. You get the athletes up close and personal, so mm -hmm. that you care about the person. And writing yeah. a piece of metal down. I have to say, I beg to differ on whether computers have ever had good hair. So back <laughs> in my in the, I knew in the it. old days, <laughs> in the old days, you know, when, when I was a smoker and my ex had a long hair Maine Coon and all of that was ingested into my Mac by the... <laughs> I would open it up once Ooh. a month and remove Ooh. a kind of uh, nicotine stiffened <laughs> dreadlock that was an inverse mold of the inside oh, of my computer. So oh my God. And for certain values of good hair, that was pretty good hair. <laughs> all right. So first of all, we've all switched to vaping now. So like no one smokes inside. What is this? The 1400s. But I want to, I want to circle back all the way to the point of complexity it's and the, such uh, a the horrible really good image. Leo can't let it go. It's like a mullet in your computer. Yeah. The nicotine mullet, Leo, it's even better. Well, all mullets are nicotine soaked. I think that's, that's okay. Good. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. fair enough. Um, I did, on the points about rules getting more complex inside of a game and having that make it less fun, I think the NFL is a great example of this because now whenever a player makes a catch, they run 48 oh, replays to see exactly where his crazy. feet were. It and is it's so boring. Crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. I no, think actually, that has happened. Anything. That has happened. I think there is a tendency in that direction. I don't know why chess hasn't, that hasn't happened to chess. Ah, uh, it's not a judged sport. That's the thing. It's not ref. There's no referee. Essentially. So the referee well, No the one's problem. making value calls. Yeah. Essentially, if you make value calls, the sport's very different. So like an extreme example of this is like competitive drifting, which is all just judged kind of like how well you did and like um, skating and so forth. Chess is kind of the, the, the other end of that. It's just Yeah, I would say playing chess and competitive drifting are about as far apart as you can get. <laughs> and yet both make great sports on Twitch. Hey. Do you know, I once, I once saw an actual chess boxing match uh, bringing it back to Russians. Uh, I was at a science fiction convention. <laughs> Clearly there was Nantes. vodka involved as well. Okay. So yeah, Nantes, France, and they had these, these Russian guests who were ch competitive chess boxers. And the way that chess boxing works is you have uh, one little skinny guy who's a great chess player and a great big bruiser who's an amazing boxer. And you play one, um, one 
uh, volley of speed chess, and then you get up and you do one round of boxing, and then you do one <laughs> volley of speed chess, and you do, and it's basically a race to see whether the big guy can can concuss the little guy before the little guy can mate him. It, it was a, it was definitely the sport of kings. This is amazing. Wow. This is like the biathlon. This is like the biathlon. You're gonna ski, and then we're gonna hand you an assault so rifle. They played chess, and now they're getting up, and they're gonna punch each other. Uh, this is like an SNL skit. Look at this. It is like something somebody made up. It really yeah. is. Oh my I, god! As opposed to chess, which came down off a mountain on two stone tablets. Come on. <laughs> I think so. I, I don't want to say anything, but I think so. Uh, the this chat is room great. is telling me that that Magnus Carlson's uh, rating is about twenty eight forty five, and Stockfish, which you can download, it's free, it's open source, is about thirty five hundred. So there's a big, oh. big <laughs> difference. Effectively, uh, stock, you can't beat no human alive can beat Stockfish uh, at chess. It's quite interesting. Meanwhile, the boxers are, are still <laughs> finding it out. I don't want to get a YouTube takedown by the Chess Boxing Council, so I'm going to uh, conclude. <laughs> this, is, this is the World Chess Boxing Championship, a match no one will ever forget. By the way, I just want to point out, two and a half million people have watched this video on YouTube. <laughs> This that, is not, that's because they're all like us. They're like, wait a minute, this what? is a thing? This can't be a no, thing. No, no, no. I think it's mostly used as kind of a Yule log during family holidays. <laughs> Just have it running in the background. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Leo, I have a great new show I want to pitch you for Twitch. Yes. <laughs> we can do this every week. We could have speed run boxing. It'd be great. I love it. Uh, oh, wow. Um, uh, where were we? Sorry. We were in Ukraine. There's still so much more. And I don't, I don't want to kind of, uh, belabor it. We've certainly been talking about it for the last two weeks. Um, I, I do have a serious question I want to ask and, and, and really get you guys to weigh in on this because I have I've really been struggling with this. So if you look at democracy overall, democracy is really struggling worldwide. And there was an Atlantic piece that really went into detail about kind of the tools that authoritarians are using around the world to kind of, uh, you know, subvert democracy and slowly take it over. And a real commonality with those tools is they all involve the tech industry to some degree, whether it's you know manufacturing consent or or propaganda or mass surveillance or you know all these different tricks. And I I wanted to ask you guys, like do you think that I have long been of the opinion that we should have to get to Corey's like we should have done this 20 years ago theme here, but we should have had discussions about how the things we were built were going to affect the society around us 20 years ago. And I kind of think what's going on in Ukraine right now is, is really an ultimate example of of how the lack of foresight in the tech industry is is fundamentally putting democracy at risk. It's pretty human. I mean, yeah. back in 1920, when we were still using electric cars, we might have considered the consequence of changing to fossil fuels. Um, but you, you know, I mean, are I, you willing to give up? That's the, that's my question. Like, because Leo, right. you're describing we could have stuck with electric cars, and they had very short ranges, and right. electricity was expensive or more expensive back then. And also, that power has to come from somewhere, and we would have burned quite coal to generate more power for it. So, would that have helped? And also, the the internal combustion engine is an incredibly useful bit of technology that we've gotten a lot of benefits from. Costs, yes. And so, when Brianna raises her very very fair point, and I think was well said, my, my fear is that if we begin to be more cautious, there's a risk of becoming overly cautious. And I know that I'm taking the, the capitalist side of this, so I'll take the stick for that. But like, uh, one, I don't think we can look far enough to really see. Two, I don't think society will slow down enough in a capitalistic democracy setup, which is the only way that I can kind of think to run things. And three, I think uh, you wouldn't be able to kind of figure things out. So no. It's very it's easy kind of to my, do so my... in hindsight. I mean, you know, Corey did a great, you know, cause and effect chain uh, over the past 20 years, but that's all in hindsight. Um, we, there's no Harry Seldon out there yet who can say, well, I, I see where this is going. Uh, and even if there were the political will to forego the benefits of the, you know, of fossil fuels or whatever, uh, certainly is like, we don't have the political will to do hardly anything. Yeah. We know the world is about to uh, be engulfed in flames. The latest IPCC report is dire 
could be no action. And and people are saying we should frack more. Yeah, as a solution. There'll be, to the there'll be literally no response. Uh, no, no rational response to that. I've. This is why I tried to end the last segment with something positive, like the return of Western liberalism and and uh, the greening of America. But I guess uh, you guys really want to go down that rabbit, the rabbit hole so, of no, despair. No. I, I think Brianna raises a really excellent point, and and I I think that the only way to to tackle it is to to break it up into different sub questions because like the. Should we should we have thought harder about what we were doing with tech? Obviously, the answer is yes. But like which parts and what role does tech play in the disintegration of democracy is something that I think um, you can't just use the unitary phenomenon of tech to to analyze that. You have to actually break down different functions. So like, well, let's say social media, let's say Facebook. Is that no, but even with social granular? media. It's not so I would enough. say that like there are three questions about Facebook and other forms of social media. So the first one is what does targeting do? The second one is what about group formation? And the third one is what about persuasion? And persuasion is the one that I think we lean on the most and is the least credible, the least plausible. So the tech giants go out there and they say, we have invented a mind control ray to sell your nephew fidget spinners. Uh, if you pay the premium that we charge for surveillance advertising, we promise that we can change people's minds and bypass their critical faculties. And then there's a certain kind of tech critic who goes, yeah, that mind control ray that they invented to sell your nephew a fidget spinner, guess what? Robert Mercer stole it and made your uncle a QAnon. And, and <laughs> I don't think that there's much evidence for it. You know, I think we see Facebook doing things like they did this experiment where they they exposed 60 million people to a stimulus they predicted would increase voter turnout. They got 300,000 people to vote, which sounds very impressive, more than they thought would. And it sounds very impressive until you realize that it's a 0.39% effect size and elections are not decided by 0.39% margins. But even though that's not a very convincing piece of evidence that Facebook can alter our, our conduct, it is, in fact, very compelling evidence that Facebook is run by the kind of donkey that performs non-consensual psychological experiments on 60 million people, and they shouldn't be running a goddamn lemonade stand. So I'm not all that worried about the persuasion part, which leaves this other question, which is, if it's not persuasion, if it's not that we're bypassing people's critical faculties, how is it that anti-democratic and other odious ideas spread? And I think that that is the function of targeting, that you can find people who are, because of their material conditions, predisposed to believe conspiratorial accounts of the world. And so I don't think that that's like, um, that they're like genetic fools. I think that it's like, if you've, if you've lived in a region that has been heavily destabilized, you've experienced serious losses, you're traumatized, you don't trust the institutions that were supposed to protect you because they failed you, then you are in fact disposed to hear um, explanations for what's going on that don't uh, include uh, a necessity that you believe that those institutions are well run when you know for a fact that they aren't. And so I think targeting is a thing that you get with advertising. And I think that it, it is a way that that all of this stuff um, has been very salient in our politics. And then the final piece is group formation, which is kind of like targeting. We are now at this moment where if you have a minority or fringe view, you can find other people who hold that minority or fringe view. And in many ways, that's amazing, right? We, we live now in a moment in which things that were illegal in living memory, it's now considered a shame and a stain on our moral character that um, we ever thought that they were wrong, right? Like homosexuality or smoking pot or, you know, a whole long list of things that, that we've had a complete reversal of our views. And the way that we got there was not by people who held heterodox views standing up and demanding to be counted. It was by people being able to speak their truth quietly to other people who they thought would listen and forming groups quietly in private so that they could then stand up and speak their truth together. And, you know, if you're a kid who's never heard the word trans, but you know there's something different about you, you can type some search terms into your favorite search engine and you can find the words for who you are. Right. And you can acquire the vocabulary and the community to describe it and you can go out and do it. Now, the same thing is true if you believe that Jews secretly run the world. You can also find the words for that and join those people. Right. And so that has also been incredibly salient to our political fortunes, but in a different way and in a way that I think is more of a mixed bag. And so I would say, like, you know, in, in terms of like the Mary keep kill uh, of these three things, I would kill uh, targeting. 
I would basically just make fun of persuasion and I would really lean into understanding and refining uh, group formation and, and trying to figure out ways to put your thumb on the scales for forming groups that are socially beneficial. I honestly feel yeah. like persuasion is just a, is just another way of saying targeting and is equal it's equally un, ineffective. I'll grant you on the group formation. What about algorithm though? You leave that out. Uh, it's that's, that's persuasion. Is that part that's of like persuasion? That's like we 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 spied on you for 2 years. Uh, we built a profile using all this junk science that doesn't reproduce like um so that's you know big five personality types or whatever. Uses. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. we just feed, like, we feed fidget spinner into it, and it pops out the message that makes you want to buy a fidget spinner. Or we feed white nationalism well, but that's into it. That's algorithm in the context of advertising. What about algorithm in the context of, I mean, what, what algorithm is really designed to do is increase engagement. Uh, later on, we'll, sure. we'll, we'll advertise to you, but we just want you want to be sticky. But the consequence of unfettered algorithm, unattended algorithm, both on YouTube and Facebook seems to be, uh, extremism seems to be persuasion in the form of moving you I, towards I guess extremism. There's, there's something to that, but you know, I don't know how you distinguish that from like, I'm really interested in carpentry. So I watch a carpentry video and then I discover that the kind of carpentry I'm interested in is in joinery. So I watch one of the suggested joinery videos. And pretty and then soon I you're that building uh, bonfires. Well, pretty soon you're like looking at Japanese nailless joinery and then yeah. there's one kind of join and then you've joined an esoteric community of people who just <laughs> care about this one joint. Like, I don't see how that's very different from any of the other so-called no, radicalization. That's, that's fairly benign, though. I mean, it, but it's the it, same thing, right? It's all it's doing is it's directing you down an esoteric pathway uh, from a very broad category to the narrow one that you're more interested in. And I don't know that it's persuading you so much as exposing you. Okay, fair I, enough. I but just flat out don't agree with that, but go ahead, Alex, okay. please. No, 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 Brianna, please. No, 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 no. It's Well, I was just going to say, I think that uh, generally speaking, not talking about you specifically, Corey, but I think there's a kind of idealism that has, has really permeated the tech industry where we kind of tell ourselves that these things we build are neutral and that it's not having long-term consequences and kind of wash our hands of it. And I, I really did used to believe that. And I just, I've, I've really come to believe that we've, We've been information idealists when we need to be information realists uh, the whole time. And I, I feel like what is going on right now is a, a really solid example of that. You, know, you talk about like uh, uh, perhaps regulating or tweaking the, the edges around the algorithm. I don't know what you know, what institution is supposed to bring those changes to the forefront. I think the core thing that's kind of rotten here, uh, if you really want to get down to centrality, is is the culture of the tech industry, where we we don't have a, a sense of morality or ownership over the things that we build. Uh, I do think the engineers, we don't have uh, ethics that we think about the same way that a, a lawyer or a doctor uh, might tend to think about that. It's good in many ways. You know, you can go out, you can build an app, you can ship it. You don't have to worry about it without any licensing. That opens many doors. I think the dark flip side that we've really kind of just said we don't want to think about or hold ourselves accountable with is that there's a, the things that we have built are increasingly really destabilizing the world. It's certainly destabilizing the democracy here in the United States. And I, I just, I, I wish we had thought about this much more. It's clear. So Twitter is a I, lot I, more fun without the Russian troll bots. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think we're mostly in agreement there. You know, I'm all for thinking through ethical precepts when it comes to your your technological choices. What I'm specifically saying, though, is if you, like me, think that the tech giants are corrosive pathological liars, that it would be pretty weird to assume that the only time they're telling the truth is when they claim that their products work really well. <laughs> and given how th thin the, the evidence is for for that for those products working well, right? For for persuasion, for persuasion working well. P and G dropped its hundred million dollar Google ad spend and saw a zero percent change in their sales. Wow. So if that's the case, right? If that if 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 it's just a con, which I think it it is, and I think one of the ways in which the tech giants are corrosive is that they're con artists. Then um, it, it is not uh, doing the tech industry's job for them to um, discount the power of algorithmic persuasion, it in fact is striking at the heart of their business because all of their money comes from the faith-based belief 
among advertisers that they can do algorithmic persuasion. Well, let I me, think it's time to do a little really ad uh, before we uh, go. Oh, okay, really quick, go ahead, and then I'll do some uh, awesome algorithmic I, persuasion coming up. I just okay. want to say I don't agree with you, Corey, and this is why. One of the big projects we did at Rebellion Pack over the last year is we went out. We got the voter list, and we did a project where we wanted to get people to go vote, people that had not voted before in a primary, people that only registered to vote for Donald Trump. And we went out, and we specifically talked targeted them. We found out really excellent information on what motivated them to get to the polls. We showed them pictures of uh, schools in their neighborhood, and we really precisely and algorithmically tailored what they saw uh, about the issues uh, and, and, and served them ads that were just really, really dialed down and created to appeal to them. I then ran those ads to them with a control group and an experiment group. And then I went and saw who actually ended up going and voting in the actual election. And while I don't know specifically who they voted for, I have actual data I can show you this, uh, that shows repeating those ads to people over and over objectively made them far more likely to go out and vote. So um, I just don't agree with your summation of the data and the studies there. And and you know to be fair, I'm not sure I would stipulate that the tech giants are corrosive. What did you call them? <laughs> <laughs> or forces for evil or forces something. Forces for evil. I mean, again, I I, I think they're I, just I a bunch of guys. I don't think that we entirely disagree because I think that it's different to find out what people care about and tell it to them versus right. asking a computer to tailor ads to them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And 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 honestly. I think they're just a bunch of guys like you and me. And, you know, maybe they went down the wrong path at one point, but I don't think they're... They're, they're the same mediocre sociopaths <laughs> that tried to corner the globe for, you know, Commodore and, and Alta Vista and DAC. The only difference is that we didn't enforce antitrust law antitrust right. law for them. And, and, and we did against all those other companies, so they weren't yeah. able to corner the market. Yeah. And Microsoft just spent twenty billion dollars buying Nuance, and it just got approved. So cool. Ugh. Oh, Nuance went through. We well, learned nothing. has the DOJ waived it through? I thought they hadn't. Uh, I th I thought it did on Friday. Oh, maybe. I think it maybe. got final I, approval. I had a busy day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, gosh. Theo, you need to pay but. the bills. <laughs> uh, this is not algorithmic. It's not targeted. I don't want you to take this personally, but I just want to say I'm fat. And uh, I have found a way to not be so fat. I think. I think Brianna, you've been doing something too. I want to say you look you look really really good. I, I lost eighty pounds with this particular eighty person. pounds. Oh I can show you the chart right here. I put on so much weight when I blew out my knee last year because you couldn't exercise. Suddenly, yeah. I couldn't exercise yeah. at all while I was waiting over COVID to get a uh, surgery to actually go do it. Hand to God, I lost eighty pounds with this sponsor, and I've kept it off now for about five months. I've lost about twenty. How much have you lost, Lisa? My wife, fifteen. Fifteen. Um, but it's not about the pounds. Yeah, It's actually about re-educating yourself about why you eat, how you eat, because honestly, no diet is ever going to work long-term for you. Noom, and that's what we're talking about, is really about education. Now, uh, of course, uh, God, you're constant, and I would understand if you go, oh, not another diet. We're constantly bombarded by this. This is not a diet, right, Lisa? Lisa's done this. It's not a diet. She swears by it. You started doing it because I was doing it to support me as a good wife because you don't need to lose weight like I do. Well, with the pandemic and having a lot of fun the first year with cooking and drinking, yes, I we did were doing a lose, lot of sourdough. I, need to lose a few. I need to get back <laughs> in alignment with yeah. where I want to be. So what happens is that e eating is, there's a lot of psychology in why you eat. It's not always... For hunger, it's not always for energy. It is often, and certainly in my case, for emotional satisfaction. Uh, I do a lot of what they what Noom calls fog eating. So Noom is a psychology based approach that helps you change the way you think about food, think about health. It doesn't say change your lifestyle. In fact, the weirdest thing when I first started doing it, I told my coach, "You have a coach. You have an app. By the way, love the app. You have little lessons. Uh, there's a there's a." Uh, a food log, which is a very important part of it. You also have a group. So there's a lot of support around it. But I told my coach, I had a hot dog last night. And I was so surprised that my coach said, that's great. I said, wait a minute. That's a bad foodie. <laughs> she said, Tia, I love you, Tia. She said, "That's there's no bad foods in Noom. It's all just food, right? 
And that was huge for me. Well, that's the best part. When I joined it with you, the number one thing that hooked me in was I saw a candy maker in a commercial say he eats candy every day <laughs> and he's maintaining and the like weight he wants and I like my sweets. <laughs> so I went, okay, so what's bad for me? Nothing's bad for you. Everything is moderation. It's your personal choice. You and get it's to knowing choose. why you're overeating. Yeah. For me, maybe, see, that's the thing. Everybody's a little different. Well, for me, it's like stress eating, ghost eating. Yeah. I tend to be yeah. less mindful when I'm stressed out. But for the most part. Mindfulness is a big part. I'm not aware of it. I just stuff my mouth, right? Yeah, but this is, it's easy and nothing's off limits. So everything is your choice. You get to make choices every day. And I have been maintaining my weight for a year now. And I've told everyone it's easy. I have like 10 friends that have lost weight on Noom and they love that's it. Amazing. And I don't think I'll ever stop just because it keeps me accountable. Noom does not believe in restricting what you can or can't eat. What Noom's doing is, is giving you the knowledge and wisdom you need to make informed, underscore informed choices that help get you closer to reaching your goals. They're using psychological uh, principles like cognitive behavioral therapy so you can better understand your relationship with food, build sustainable habits. Uh, and it, it, this is There's ups and downs. That's why Noom says it's, it's about progress, not perfection. Seven, the good news is 75% of Noom users finish the program. Uh, not everybody's going to lose 80 pounds like Brianna did. But boy, when it, it, I mean, it's, it works. It really works. It's, it's completely grounded in science. They have published more than 30 peer-reviewed scientific articles to inform users and practitioners and scientists about what they're doing, how effective it is. Uh, it's empowering. It's not stress-inducing. It's not guilt. There's no guilt. There's no feeling bad because that just makes you eat more. You know that. We all know that. Uh, you No fear of ruining your whole program with one off day. Noom helps you get back on track. Do you decide how Noom weight fits into your life, not the other way around? Uh, the, the, the readings are quick, 10 minutes a night. Uh, I got more than you. I don't know why, Lisa. You'd be done and I'd still be doing my... Well, that's because I'm on maintenance, so I get like one oh, article that's why. a day. That's why. I just love this. I love the, I'm, I'm about knowledge. I love knowing why I'm doing it, and that helps me eat more healthily. I, and I have really changed my habits. Start building better habits. Sign up for your trial. I don't know how else to say it. You, you're bombarded with these, you know, diets and so forth. This is not that. This is something very different. N O O M. Noom.com slash twit. Sign up for your trial at N O O M, noom.com slash twit. We get Lisa to come in because she's my uh, my poster girl for this. But now I have to say, Brianna, whoa, <laughs> you, you're, you're a poster child too. That's pretty impressive. I, what, what I love about this is, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. That's not really a place where you have a lot of French baby education. Man, it's not. Hush puppies. I, I, I had all these bad habits that I didn't have to think through because I'm pretty active through my 20s and my 30s. And, you know, then your 40s come and you're like, oh, well, I actually need to yes. think about how what I eat affects my body. Yes. This was really resetting things. And the, the thing I love the most about this is I, it's not that it's saying you can't eat pizza or chicken wings or things like that. But once you kind of understand how what you eat affects your body, you crave other things. That's right. That's that you right. You don't even, it's not like Frank ate a pizza at the movie the other day. And I, I just had no desire to eat that whatsoever. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's building a habit and changing the way, the things that you hunger for. You look and great. That's sustainable. You really do. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I knew that it was not bad to eat a hot dog, I ate less hot dogs actually. <laughs> when, you, when you're told no hot dogs for you, that's when you crave, I must have a hot dog. We went out last night. Lisa said you could have a hot dog tonight. Did I? No. Yes. No, I didn't have a hot dog. Oh, no, no. That's right. You had chicken parm. Well, it's not as <laughs> It's almost as bad. That's an improvement. It's like I had it's garlic fried fries and fried Brussels cheese. sprouts. She had garlic fries, but we but we wrote it down, right? We put it in our noom. I that's didn't go over my calories. Yeah. That's all I got to say. Anyway, uh, that's a long ad for something uh, that a few of us are pretty excited about. Noom.com slash twit. Thank you, Noom. All right. Speaking of rapacious tech giants who are only out to take our money, Apple's going to have a big <laughs> event on Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> 
I, I'm already mad because I, I, have, I have an iMac with an M1 chip in it, and I know they're going to drop a new one with a better chip, and I'm going to have iMac Envy, and I hate how they do this. Oh to me. man, oh. I am I am sitting here saying take my money. I am such a sucker for this. Uh, if they announce a Mac Mini, I'm already I've got them down for three. I think Lisa wants one. I'm going to get one. John, you want one? Oh, Micah needs one. We got four. I'm down for four. And you want a, a pro? Well, that's coming later in the year. We don't know what's going to be announced on Tuesday. Rumor says uh, iPhone SE with 5G, a new iPad Air, kind of more pro model. What everybody will be looking for is other stuff. And the invitation seems to imply something more than just an iPhone and an iPad. The tagline is peak performance. And it's spelled... P-E-E-K, like you're going to peek at something. And the uh, lately, all of their uh, invitations have had an AR component. The AR component looks like you're kind of wandering down. There's something around the corner in that apple. So I'm starting to think maybe this is where they announce what they have long been rumored to be working on, some sort of VR or AR headset. Some of the rumors. I have to say, peak performance sounds like they're launching an OnlyFans competitor. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's peep performance. That's another thing. Uh, either one. <laughs> Peaking. I, can I just? I'm very excited about this because I, I was actually at Microsoft's campus when they uh, first let people play with Hololens, which is a project that has seemed to be slowly losing steam at Microsoft. But there's even rumors the idea, they're going to cancel the third uh, edition. Makes me so sad because when I wore those dorky goggles and had my first like real AR experience that was um, good, it was awesome. Like I had such a great time and I was so impressed with it. I was like, ah, oh, the future is here. Fantastic. And then all the companies that were doing AR kind of pivoted to industrial uses and then it kind of fizzles out. And so if, if anyone's going to be able to pull this off, I think it's probably going to be Apple. And so like as a nerd who's been looking forward to AR and VR becoming more mainstream in general for some time, bring it on. I, I'm going to retain 10% optimism here and 90% credit card fear. I, I will, uh, we'll make out, <laughs> we'll make some bingo cards and we can put AR VR as one of the uh, entries on the, on the bingo card. It'll be interesting. We're going to live stream it as we always do. Micah Sargent and I will do it at 10 a.m. Pacific on uh, Tuesday. That's 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC. We do that mystery science theater 3000 kind of thing where, you know, Tim will be talking and we'll be talking behind him in the background, uh, snarking, having fun getting excited, bringing out our checkbooks, uh, all of that. It's it's hard not when you're watching these events not to get sucked into what used to be called the reality distortion field. Can, I, can I give you a little bit of a wake up on this from oh, a please. point of view? Yes. So this is, this is what really concerns me about this particular technology. It's not that I don't think Apple can do drop-dead sexy hardware because I do. It's it's that Apple's 3D ecosystem is so limited and myopic, myopic compared to the tools the rest of the industry uses. You're talking about a Unity versus, say, uh, the Unreal Engine. I, I I specialize in Unreal. Let's take that. Uh, Unreal so is that, amazing. It, it's really great. But Unreal is I, from Epic, and as you know. <laughs> but they've got some problems there. <laughs> Epic but and Apple when, just don't mix. Yeah, 100%. On top of that, if you're going to use 3D modeling software, you're using Max, you're using Maya, you know, no one's going to go use, uh, you know, like the freeware versions of it. They're you can use terrible. Maya on a Mac, can't you? You can, but the problem is it's so poorly maintained. It just is not a good experience. Oh, that's experience. interesting. So, huh. so my point here is we all agree Apple can do the hardware for this. Uh, but as far as getting 3D professionals to bite the bullet and, and, and go all in and develop things for Apple, this is a really big lift. You're asking them to know Swift. You're asking them to go through and start learning uh, Apple's like graphical APIs, which are, it's just not a workflow that is the rest of the industry standard workflow. You're really asking people to move over into Apple's walled garden and mm. ask yourself how successful that has been with the games Apple is bringing to market. 
go look at Apple Arcade. They've got some cute stuff there. It's fun. It's a certain floor of quality. I'm happy to pay for it every month. But there's nothing there that's going to compete with uh, Elden Rings, right? Which is built using a more traditional work. Is it on so, Unreal? What is it? Or does it have its own engine? I, I would guess it's Unreal just looking at it, but I don't, I don't know yeah. offhand. My, my point here is <laughs> Apple's walled garden is going to be a barrier to getting widespread adoption from the very professionals they need to build content for this. Is, so that explains something we've been asking a lot, which is why is gaming so laggard on uh, on Apple devices? It's really, uh, it owns casual gaming, but yeah. AAA titles like Elden Ring are just not going to appear on the Apple platform. Is that why? There's just no money to be made in translating it over to Apple Silicon. Yeah. But currently, there's just it's just not... Like people would try it. There are a lot of Macs out there, right? If you could make money doing this, I'm sure people would do it. Uh, you know, as it is, we can barely get Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which came out a long time ago at this point. So, yeah. yeah I, that By the way, Elden say, Ring runs yeah. on their own, from software has their own uh, Bloodborne, Dark Souls, Sekiro engine that they use. That, that makes a lot of, Bandai Namco published it though, so that's very. Surprising. There's a look. There's a look to it. It's a little desaturated. Yeah. It has a certain. It's very. Feels like the details are very fine. It's a very. It's yeah. a distinct look. Yeah. On, on the Mac point though, with gaming, like I, I have a, a gaming PC that's medium, and I have a recent iMac, and um, the old gaming PC can run Crusader Kings three with no issues whatsoever. On my very new iMac, it is a complete catastrophe, and yeah. I think yeah. that that's because the systems are not designed to do games and there's not and so you know until apple decides well, that's that the question be serious about is this. it that the systems are not designed to do games or is it more that developers aren't willing to live in apple's wall garden and it's maybe it's both well i mean i was right i'm running steam on the imac which is the same steam that i run on pc so like you, you yeah but there are that, very few not, steam games i mean hey i love civ 6 as much as the next guy but there are very yeah. few steam, steam games that run on <laughs> on macintosh you know what's really interesting the steam deck is starting to come out now i know Corey, you're a big linux fan as i am that's linux it's arch linux and as a result, uh, a lot of developers are now tweaking their games to run on Linux. Linux is actually beating Macintosh as a gaming platform. <laughs> My brother-in-law is going to be so happy. Isn't it? Uh, well, I've been playing Valheim on Linux. It's Linux first. It was written on Linux and then ported to Windows. Uh, and it runs beautifully. It runs great. Um, what, what's Valheim? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to know. It's just this. Viking, it's a Viking survival game. It's. I'm a little weird. It's just a weird. That thing. that uh, I, I played Frostpunk, which is just the same thing, but you're against ice instead of Vikings, and I played that for like a hundred hours. No, you so like, are a Viking in this. Don't don't ah. don't get it wrong. You are a Viking. You uh you're you've you've died. You're a Viking warrior who's died, and Odin has brought you back from Valhalla to conquer. Uh, the evil forces that are taking over this world. You've got a big, the big uh, Yggdrasil tree is over you at all times, hovering over you. Odin appears once in a while to check in on you, and mostly you're just building. But the thing is, you can, it's amazing what you can build in Valheim. It's kind of like a, a grown up kind of ma Minecraft a little bit. So there's, what, there's. What about this is strange though, because the number one show on Netflix is Vikings Valhalla. Right <laughs> And so, like, I think you're describing the time like, the is game uh, of the, show. the time is right for me. I mean, uh, I quarantine was Valheim and Animal Crossing. <laughs> it's kind of pathetic. The stuff, the stuff that's got me very interested in in Linux hardware. On the one hand, is the rise of super repairable open frameworks, laptops. baby. My framework yeah. laptop. It's the best laptop I've ever owned. Me too. Uh, now not, that's interesting because you were a Lenovo uh, fanatic. I was a ThinkPad guy. Yeah, yeah. but. Yeah. The ThinkPads became impossible to fix. So I'm like way more interested in fixing it than a thing that doesn't break because I can break anything and I do. So, you know, I had I had ThinkPads and I would like just, you know, hit the keys too hard habitually and wear out my key switches and have to replace the keyboard. And, you know, for the first 10 years, it was that you'd move two tabs and you lift the keyboard out and you put the new one and you were done. And then, you know, I got one and I wanted to swap the keyboard and it turned out you had to remove every single component. You needed like five special tools. Ugh. It was basically, you took, you opened it up in the back and you removed everything between the back and the keyboard. And then you took the keyboard out and then you rebuilt the laptop. So this framework, you know, I got the first batch. So it had a couple of like hardware glitches. So I had to replace the, the hinges and, um, I did it after the day after my hip replacement, 
uh, only only sitting up 45 degrees, stoned out of my gourd on uh, on on oxies, and it took me 11 minutes. He can so, replace his keyboard, stone on oxy, in 11 yeah. minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, it was, I mean, it is remarkable. So on the one hand, I'm really interested in those things. And on the other hand, I'm just interested in all the, like, Raspberry Pi and, like, micro microcontroller-based, tiny, weird, 3D-printed, one-off like cyberspace decks and palm tops and just these these it's hardware hacking homemade computers there's one if you google like chunky palm top c h o n k palm top and you'll get a, a gitlab site for daniel norris it's I think it's the the coolest looking computer I don't know if I could ever use it but it is the coolest looking computer I've seen since <laughs> You what know, for am I looking at? The keyboard is, is a little chunky. Thing? Did it get melted? It is a, was it microwave? It's a chunky palm top. That is oh that is a God. palm top that is very chunky. You know what I just got, and I'm kind of excited. I got a Pine Phone Pro, which uh -huh. is a Linux phone, as you know, uh, Corey running Manjaro with KDE, and I bought the keyboard for it. And now I it is now a clamshell, tiny little clamshell computer, with LTE. It's very intriguing to me. Um, yeah, I agree with you 100. percent The what was you know a, a industry dominated by beige boxes and and mm -hmm. you know if you were a little weird a Mac has now really exploded into so many different and interesting things. A guy called me uh, yesterday on the radio show. He wanted to uh, do a smart frame. And he said, you know, I have this Windows NUC that I could use with a monitor, but the only software out there I have to pay a subscription for. I said, what are you trying to use a Windows PC for this? Get a Raspberry right. Pi. There's a hundred yeah. different ways to do a smart mirror or a smart frame for free. Uh, open and I just, source. I love that these are all custom builds, one-offs. I had a friend over for dinner and drinks last night, a guy, a couple, Tom Jennings, who created a thing called FidoNet. Uh, I know Tom day. very well. I was a FidoNet yeah. sysop in 94. You know, absolutely lovely fella. And one of his long running hobbies is rebuilding. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Rebuilding Nash Ramblers. And he has just like customized Nash Ramblers in so many different ways. And he's got one that he built a, a high performance Nash Rambler hot rod that's got like two microcontrollers in it to control the fuel injection. And he's just, you know, the one he showed up with last night had like a Mobius paint job down the side and a wow. rebuilt engine. And, I just love this, this, um, you know, maybe it's the Walter Benjamin in me, but you know, this, these, these one-off hand-built idiosyncratic, you know, the no two alike kind of gadgets. And the thing, the fact that you can get a thing that looks like the chunky palm top that has the fit and finish of a thing that looks like it came off an injection molding line, but is actually just a thing one person made and there's only one of them, uh, is, is really cool. Give me, I I am thrilled to hear that Tom is around and active. Is uh, what is he besides doing ramblers? Uh, it's is, like semi retired. Nice. You know, he and his boyfriend have a dog. The dog is old. They're having a nice time. <laughs> he's you know, he's roughly my age, so he's an old timer. But Tom, yeah. uh, so this kids, there was before the internet, there was this thing called BBSs, bulletin board systems. <laughs> And the and the best you you wouldn't even remember this, Alex. The best. Oh no, uh, this is before my time. Yeah, way before. The best of them was Fido, Fido Net. Uh, I ran a Fido uh, BBS with not one but two phone lines in the um, in the mid '80s, and uh, and in fact, uh, we were doing an early version of a. Uh, a global messaging system called EchoNet on top of FidoNet, where it was kind mm -hmm. of a store and forward mail system. And it was really uh, interesting, exciting times. And I like that Fido hacker Nets, ethic, that that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And FidoNet's, Fido Nets, you know, its killer app was that each FidoNet BBS would call other ones that were nearby and exchange messages yeah, with them. That was EchoNet. Yeah. Program it for when, yeah. yeah, when the when the long distance rates were lowest and so on and build it out. And you know the uh, the I met Tom at a conference that um, my friend John Gilmore, who helped start EFF, was at, and John started the first uh, BBS or first uh, inter ISP rather. It was a thing called the Little Garden in San Francisco. Yes, I remember. And and his CTO is a guy called Tim Pozar, and Tim Good and friend. John, yep. and yeah, and Tim and John and and, and you know uh, we're we're reminiscing about FidoNet uh, with with Tom and about the day that they bridged FidoNet into Usenet. And like wow. they wrote a little software to bridge the two in. And I remember because I was on a FidoNet uh, bulletin board in Toronto as, you know, a callow youth with an Amiga 1000. 
And I remember the day that the internet arrived on my local BBS, right? This suddenly Usenet had been imported holus bolus into my local BBS. And then listening to these three dudes just talk about like writing the code to do it. It was really amazing. It was like it was like eavesdropping on, you know, God and his angels describing how they hung the stars in the firmament or something. It was really wild. <laughs> Tim uh, was the uh, chief engineer of the radio station I was working at. He introduced me to Tom, uh, and uh, the rest is history. And uh, wow. Yeah. So there's a, there's a full circle story. Can I just throw in one thing here? Because I'm a little bit younger, and so my first internet experience was dial-up on Windows 95, more or less. Maybe it's 98. Um, I feel like I missed something very interesting. Just listen to you guys talk this through. And with, when the, the technology world was, was seems to be smaller and more, like, nascent, you know, yes. now people and more are like hobbyist, deep, more yeah. do it yourself kind of now, now Tom that the kids are doing NFTs and it doesn't seem to have the same ethos to it. <laughs> Tom has this incredible story he tells about these arguments that used to happen on FidoNet all the time. And the way that the shape of the argument was that someone would say, how dare you come into my living room and talk to me that way? <laughs> and he would have to cool people out. Like it was before Bill Gibson coined the term cyberspace, right? And he would just have to explain that like, although the conversation is happening in your living room for you, the person <laughs> who's having that conversation with you is not in your living room. Like you you just need to think re back to norms. You need to rethink your normative framework for this discussion yeah. that we're having. I'm just looking through, somebody has published, I guess it's, I guess there's still FIDO locations around. This is the FIDO net uh, mm. node list. Which, oh, that's great. Yeah. Oh my God. These are these uh, most of these units are down, but the some right. a surprising number are still around. I when wonder, the apocalypse comes, this is going to be the internet, by the way. That you just saw <laughs> right there. That's gonna be what we have left. Those might be the last landlines still in use. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure somebody has created a uh, a back end. In fact, it looks like uh, there is a back end of the internet so that Sure. Uh, some of these don't have phone number. A lot of these don't have phone numbers, but some do. Some do. I've often thought about creating a video game that would be 80s hacker. It would bring uh -huh. back those haze commands yeah. and like the way, yeah. the way you had to sign on to bulletin boards and download things like I back was, in the 80s. I was waxing the nostalgic about my early uh, coding days. Back uh, when I had FidoNet, it was so hard to get in with only two phone lines. I wrote a demon dialer for the Macintosh because it was a Macintosh uh, board, Mac Q, uh, 85, 86, early days of Mac. I wrote a demon dialer, and I th I'm still convinced it was the first multitasking program ever written for the Mac. I used the vertical blank interval when the electron gun goes from the bottom to the top of the screen to start drawing it again. There's a brief few milliseconds that the computer can't do anything that you can grab and say, stuff the ATDT command into the modem ah! one character at a time. So it stuffed the command in, it stuffed the phone number in, and then it would stuff the dial command. And then every vertical blank, 60 times a second, would check to see if it was a busy signal or if it was ringing. And there was a haze command for, I got through. And then it would make a big, eh, 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 when it got through. <laughs> it was called Q-Dial. Ah. It was purpose-built. It would only dial my BBS. But... Uh, uh. What's a That's haze great. command? Never mind. Forget you know. Oh, so boy. let's talk about the framework laptop. This poor kid here, he never heard of a haze. Guys, I'm 32. Like I know that I'm the young person on the show, but like I'm not exactly 17. Like I'm not cool either. And I'm I'm just saying, like, this stuff sounds awesome. I'm not even trying to be pejorative. Like, no, I'm, no, no, I'm no, curious about what you, I missed. Haze commands were it's a it's a great story, right? It was a proprietary, it was a proprietary command set to control modems that then became a de facto standard. And there was, you know, there was saber rattling, stop making modems that are compatible with my command set, and so on. It was one of those early fights that looks a lot like some of the fights we've had since about about whether, like, I mean, I think if you follow the Oracle API uh lawsuit, yeah. you know, the Hayes command set story would would seem pretty familiar to you. Yeah, no kidding. What yeah. goes around comes around. You're not that old, though, Corey. I'm surprised you remember all this I'm stuff. 51, almost. <clears throat> 50 and a half. You must have been a, ch a mere child. when all but, this So my dad was a computer scientist who ah, brought home a teletype in 1977 ah, with an acoustic go. coupler. There you go. Uh, and so, yeah, that was my first My first dial-up was PDPs, and yep. it was uh, yep. basic interpreters, Eliza, and yep. a chat program with the seven other people who could dial into How that about, mainframe. Did you ever play Colossal Cave? 
Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I spent hours. I did all the nostalgia computing. Yeah. You, you have to put the handset in the rubber yep. <laughs> suction cup. And then if anybody picks up the phone while you're in the Colossal Cave, Mom, get off yeah. the phone. Uh, I'm sorry. A oh, acoustic that? coupler sounds like science fiction. Uh, are you telling me this is actually backwards technology? Because <laughs> that so, sounds awesome. Yeah. You had to. You, so you know how when you get on your modem, it goes. Eric, oh, yeah. And then it goes. And then it turns off because you don't want to hear. That actually is analog sound that can be translated into ones and zeros. That's how phone lines send data. An acoustic coupler worked with your standard telephone. Here's one. And you yeah, would it take a, it had a mic what? and a speaker. Yeah. And you just hung the phone up in it. <laughs> so That's this the is a modem. I've ever seen. It would turn the sound into <laughs> and it would send it down the phone line as sound. So if you listened, yeah. that's what you'd hear. I, I'm in awe of how cool this. That's like so. That feels very DIY hackerish, like in that cool and in, in, in a that was retro kind of cool way. Back then, yeah. No, that that's all it was for me. I'm a little. I'm a little younger than uh, than Leo and Corey, but you know, I saw war games, and I'm like, I mm -hmm. want to know how to do all of this. Like yeah. I, I, I had to learn that instantly. So I got my parents to go get me uh, acoustic couplers were out by that time. It was like a 2400 baud modem that you would plug in, but like mm -hmm. writing a program to go through and like auto dial BBSs. And there was mm -hmm. no security back then. None. If you just hit the <laughs> jackpot, it would be something. So oh, I had all sorts of stuff on there, man. I loved oh, it was great. So uh, I'm going to pull a Corey here. This sure. goes back to the Carter phone decision. Because I was just going to say, this is Carter phone. <laughs> you and I are okay. on the same wavelength here. <laughs> you, I'll, I'll bite. What's that? <laughs> I'll let Corey explain. <laughs> so uh, in the old days, so this is actually really relevant to the discussions we have about things like Facebook today, about whether we should like break them up or just try and make them behave themselves. So for 68 years, the FTC and the DOJ tried to break up AT&T. And AT&T kept getting these new leases on life by offering to try and solve the problems they created. So they would like do universal service to make up for all the co-ops and small businesses that they put out of business with predatory conduct. And, and one of the things that, that, that would happen is every time they would become more central to safety and security is they would get um, uh, more power to control their competitors. And one of the things they got was the right to decide who could plug things into the bell system. So the, the first layer of this was they had the right to control mechanical coupling to the bell system. And they went after a company that sold, it was called Hushaphone, and they sold these cups that went over the receiver of your phone so that you could talk into them like this <laughs> and people couldn't read your lips or hear you. And they argued that by making a plastic cup that fit over your phone, you were endangering the bell system and thus America's public safety and security apparatus. They lost that case, but they retained the right to control electric coupling to the system until Carter Phone came along. And Carter Phone was a gadget for ranch hands. And what it would let you do is plug a walkie-talkie into your phone with an acoustic coupler. And when your phone rang, it would transmit it to a walkie-talkie on your belt when you were out in the barn or out on the range. And they argued that the electric coupling of the, um, because there was a way to, dete to detect that it was ringing and take it off hook, that the electric coupling was itself uh, another danger to the system. And once again, the, the courts told them to go to, to buzz off. And that opened the door for modems, answering machines, PBXs, just like all kinds of things that we plug in, the Sports, Sports Illustrated complimentary football-shaped phone, all of those things, because prior to that, their subsidiary, Western Digital, was the only company able to make phones. And they were able to do all kinds of really abusive things. Like you couldn't buy a phone. Uh, you could only lease it. And then over the course of your lease, you might pay for that phone a hundred times. And as late as the 2010, there were still customers like old people who were still leasing a Western Digital phone that they'd had for 60 years and paying like $10 a month to lease a phone whose retail value at that point was less than $1, you know, and right. and, and they were still making money on, on this. So yeah, it was Carter Phone was this turning point that ended all kinds of predatory scams that were endemic to having a regulated monopoly instead of, uh, you know, breaking it up and making it weaker so that other firms can compete with it. It was actually broken well, up in 84. Four, I think. 82. Right? 82. 82. So right before I set up years. that BBS. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that's where there's the, no... Wouldn't have been able to do a BBS without it. 
Well, yeah, yeah. so Fidonet wouldn't have existed if they hadn't broken up the bells and, and made them uh, have long distance competition. Yep. Right? Because it was long distance competition that made Fidonet possible. Here's something none of you remember. Maybe you will, Corey. You might be old enough. You get on a long distance call and you go, I got to make this quick. It's costing a lot of money. <laughs> 100%. Nowadays, eh, you can call around the world for nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Yep. There's no historical parallels whatsoever to Carter Phone and uh, closed app ecosystems at all, it sounds oh, like. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah, no, not at all. Google it's versus exactly. Oracle goes right straight So back. essentially, yeah. welcome to Twit, where time is a flat circle and we go <laughs> round and round. Meanwhile, back to the framework laptop. Uh, yeah. yeah. Actually, let's take a break and then we'll get back to the framework okay. laptop. Because I do want to, you know, uh, I want to give them a big fat plug because we really want this to continue on. It is more than just people on Oxy trying to change their keyboards. It really, it really it has a lot of stuff. But this is something. Hinges, can, hinges. <laughs> hinges, hinges. That's right. Actually, I, I was the second batch and I have had zero problems. Uh, I've been hoping to have a problem just so I can I can get stoned on Oxy. But I but nothing. Uh, this is something you're gonna know about, Alex, because in fact you told me you know these guys. Podium, right? Yeah. This is how another way the world has changed. I, and it finally it fits into my introvert lifestyle. I hate calling people. I hate calling for dinner reservations. I hate I don't want to call anybody anytime. If I can text message I'm a happy camper. Well, it turns out, I guess I'm not alone. Text messaging is, and maybe it's because of COVID, all of a sudden the way to communicate from a business to a customer. Uh, and that's what Podium is all about, the ultimate text messaging platform. You know, the open rate on text messages is well over 90%. It's the best way to get to a customer. What can you do? You can say, hey, how did you like that hot dog? Leave a review on Yelp. Text them a message. Give them a link. The, the chances are you're going to get that review. Uh, you want to? I get a text message every other week from the local ice cream shop. It says, I haven't seen you in a while. Here's a 30% off coupon. It really works. You can use Podium to collect payments. You can use them for a whole variety of interactions. Imagine... Uh, I used it the other day. I needed. A, I had a window broken. I, I I looked up a bunch of different glaziers. That's the name of somebody who fixes your windows. <clears throat> I I texted them. First one to respond. First one to get the job. Using Podium. With Podium, you close deals with customers before the competition even has a chance to call them back. And you're. You're going to love it. Your staff is going to love it because it all goes however they contact you. You can put Podium on your website. You can do it in any way. However they contact you, it goes into one inbox. It's easy for you to respond. You don't have enough hours in the day to play phone tag with your customers. And frankly, this is what your customers want. That's why so many businesses, more than 100,000 businesses, streamline their customer interactions with Podium. You can get started for free right now, P-O-D-I-U-M, podium.com slash twit, or sign up for a paid Podium account. You'll get a free credit card reader. Uh, some restrictions apply. That's podium.com slash twit. Brandon Sanderson. Oh, ah, very I true. That. Yeah. Um, uh, Corey, I, I don't know. Do you feel jealous? <laughs> or, I, you know, he's I'm really following him, in your footsteps. Great. Yeah, yeah. I, well, he had done another one. He did this um, with a limited edition hardcover before. He's done a series of these limited edition hardcovers that did extremely well, over a million dollars. And then he then he decided to do a, a fully self published book. I think it's great. I think he's doing amazing stuff and showing how we can get around it, uh, around the the choke points in the system. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to see him doing it. Um, you know, it, it I sure I, beats I, a $50,000, uh, 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 upfront and uh, 5% of the net. <laughs> sure. I mean, I hope he does. I hope he, he, and I'm sure he is thinking about on these lines. I hope he does the kinds of things that George Martin did, which is roll a bunch of money into arts funding yeah. uh, and into, you know, platform building and so on that, that, you know, whether that's like Meow Wolf for the Cocteau theater or the other things that George has done. Where you know you take some of that money and you turn it into a lasting legacy. I didn't know that. Gone. Good for him. Oh yeah, good for yeah. him. Yeah, George is great. George has done amazing things with yeah. with um, his uh, his HBO money. Well, I'll stop yelling at him to finish the. the series. Yeah, can <laughs> you finish that book? 
I've been waiting kind of... for a long time now. I would like to read it. I, I actually, I think I have to go back and read all of them again. It's been so long. Which yeah, is you forget. Yeah, you guys start Storm over. Storm of Swords was so long. So I started. Anna, what were you trying to say? No, no, I was just going to say, I'm really torn on this one. You know, I knew Brandon before he really, uh, you know, got the Wheel of Time series and really kind of went to the next plane. He got of, to finish. Of author success. Yeah, Robert Jordan's uh, right. began the 15 volume series and passed away right. before he finished it. Brandon Sanderson so, was nominated to finish it and did, I think did a very good job, by the yeah, way. Yeah, he did. Yeah. He did a great job. He's a really nice person, in, like in real life. Uh, I'm, I could not say a single bad sentence about him. I, I do think it's worth pausing and thinking about what the consequences of this are for the rest of the industry. And we have authors here, so I don't want to like explain how the book industry works, but for the audience, you know, you have really big names that sell a ton of books, right? You've got the Stephen Kings, you've got the James S.A. Corey's. They are the tent pole people that put out a product and you know it's going to make enough money that the the publishers and the editors and all the other people that work in book publishing are able to, you know, make more bets on smaller books, most of which are going to fail to make any money whatsoever. And at the core, what you have here is one of the, the most independent names here, uh, one of the most successful names here that's saying, you know what, I'm going to get around the whole public publishing industry part of this here. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to print the books myself. So I'm going to pay for the warehouse. I'm going to ship it myself. And I'm just going to eat the entire, you know, I'm going to vertically integrate the entire process and get this out and keep more of the money. Yeah, the truth is that the Brandon Sandersons of the world are able to negotiate a much better deal than someone who may not have a successful track record in, in publishing um, uh, already. And I just worry that in a future where everyone does this, what does this mean for the entire publishing industry overall? I think it would be very bad for it. So, you know, when hmm. I read like authors on Facebook that are just really bitter towards Brandon, it comes across as, as sour grapes. He's a, he's a fantastic author that delivers for his audience and deserves all the success in the world. I just think it's worth saying that the, the people that work in publishing, which are overwhelmingly women, you know, this is an industry that Amazon has been wildly successful at, you know, stripping the profits from it. More and more people are working for low lower wages and, you know, the advances for starting authors are getting lower and lower. And I think this trend is going to accelerate that. Bef I, I'm going to get well, Corey's comment on this, but before we sure. do, I should explain, because I don't think we've explained. Brandon Sanderson during COVID was busy scribbling away and wrote four novels in the last two years, went to Kickstarter, uh, started a Kickstarter to buy copies of these books and various swag boxes. Planned to get a million dollars over 30 days. Within a day, he had 15 million. He's up to 24.8 million and 24 days to go. Uh, and of course, except for the cut the Kickstarter takes, that all goes into his pocket. So that's well, a, minus his production costs and but what yeah. he cover cost to print the book and so yeah. forth. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting thing. But what about Brianna's contention that that undermines that the if these tent poles pull out, the whole thing collapses. So, I, I mean, I, I think that there's, it's definitely the case that large publishers benefit from having these winner take all authors under their, under their, uh, wing. But, you know, as an author, I think the thing that, um, presents the largest risk to negotiating leverage and our ability to, to do well is, is not whether or not large publishers have access to tentpole books it's concentration in the industry overall and, and up and down the supply chain. So there, there's one distributor left, right? They, they bought out their, their major rival. So it's just Ingram. There's one major online bookstore. There is one major national brick and, brick and mortar chain. There are only four major publishers left. Um, and then in other parts of the sector, for example, in, in screenwriting, there's, there's four major super agencies that all decided that they were going to start uh, taking big chunks out of their writers uh, and using something called packaging fees that sparked a four-year writer strike that just, just ended successfully with, for the writers. 
And I think it's that lack of competition that means that you just can't shop around. I mean, definitionally, when you have a, um, a buyer's market, right, when there are more sellers than buyers, buyers don't have to work as hard to attract the sellers and acquire what they want. And it's true that those tentpole authors can write their own ticket. And it's always been the case that those tentpole authors can write their own ticket. I mean, nominally, all writers get the same royalty rates. They are standardized across the industry and across publishers. But the reality is that big name writers will often get paid uh, an advance that is impossible to earn out. So they're being paid an advance against the royalties they'll eventually earn. But the publisher understands that they will never earn out that advance. And what they're effectively doing is a backdoor uh, higher royalty rate for those, for those writers. So it's always been the case that those big writers have had extra negotiating leverage. But for little writers, I think the thing that that gives uh, the most negotiating leverage is just having more places to sell your books. And, you know, there is some empirical basis for this. So my co-author on this book, Choke Point Capitalism, that Beacon's publishing in September, is a great Australian scholar called Rebecca Giblin. She's a copyright scholar, and she worked with the Australian Author Society to do the largest ever empirical analysis of, of uh, publishing contracts, where she got anonymized publishing contracts for some really large, appreciable fraction of all the books published in Australia in kind of in modern history and was able to use those as a data set to really empirically trace the change in authors advances and in the royalties paid out and in you know things like how many other rights you have to sell to sell your book so whether you get to keep your audio rights and sell them separately or what have you and she found you know that that the strongest correlate of declining fortunes for authors is market concentration not you know, the profitability of the firms. In fact, the profitability of the firms is uh, moves inversely to author compensation because as the firms become more concentrated, they become more profitable and they pay lower advances. So it's it. I, I don't think that simply making the firms more profitable gets authors a better deal. If we're going to get authors a larger share of that money, the firms have to be competing for the authors. Well, that's really the case, not just in publishing, but across the board. Absolutely. Whether it's Starbucks... Or anybody else, you know, you say, well, if these guys could make more money, we could pay better. It seems to be quite the opposite, as a matter of fact. The, the <laughs> word the word you're looking for here is monopsony, which yes. is when there's a concentration in sellers rather yes, than buyers. That's right. And, you know, doctrine for 40 years has been that we don't have to worry about monopsony. We just have to worry about monopoly. And monopsony effects are much more sharply felt. The models show that when, when there's a buyer that accounts for as low as 10%, of a single sector that they can start distorting the the whole structure of the sector. And so, you know, when you think about Amazon with with 40 to 50% you know. of trade book sales and 90% of audiobook sales through Audible, they really are able to squeeze everyone. I mean, Audible's embroiled in this Audible Gate scandal now where the independent authors that um, had signed up for Audible and in many cases were locked into not selling anywhere but Audible now, because one of them is a forensic accountant and got sent some real royalty statements by accident and not the fake ones that they've been sent, they reckon that more than $100 million has been stolen from independent authors that way. Stolen how? Just in wage theft. Pure wage theft. Just, just, just misaccounting for royalties. Wow. Because you have to take their word for it. That's right. If you look up AudibleGate, it was trending on Twitter AudibleGate a little while. AudibleGate.com. They actually, uh, yeah. I guess they've got a class action that they, yeah. they're, they're starting up. I, for one, am shocked that Amazon was behaving poorly. <laughs> well, and and abusing its its workforce and suppliers, right? I mean, that is Amazon's Amazon's promise has always been: we will give you lower costs, and please just don't look very closely right. at how we're yeah. achieving that cost basis because it's by immiserating the people in our mm. supply chain, whether they're warehouse workers or drivers peeing in bottles or authors who are having their royalties stolen. Corey's books are not on Audible; they're on what Libro.fm, right? Sure. Yeah. And, uh, and on Downpour and Google Play, Downpour. basically anywhere that doesn't require you to have DRM. Because the, the other thing about Audible is that they will only sell with DRM even if the author doesn't want it. And then they won't allow, even if the author authorizes it, they won't allow their customers to remove the DRM. So once you buy Audible, you're stuck with Audible forever. It's a bit like the BBC hoping that you will have a separate BBC app for all your podcasts. Um, Audible has achieved a situation in which if you want to listen to audiobooks from someone else, you have to have a second app. You can't just take your audiobooks and put them in another app the, the way that you could. It'd be like if you had to have both pages and Word on your Mac in order to read Word files, right. you know. Choke Point Capitalism comes out this fall. Rebecca Giblin, Cory Doctorow. 
from now you're publishing those with Pen Penguin Random House. Have you done you've done self publishing too though, right? I have, yeah. So that's actually it's from Beacon, but Penguin Random House distributes it. Oh, okay. I've I've self published. I've published with I think now all of the big four. Uh, and Macmillan is my main publisher. And I've done a, with a bunch of small presses, including some great ones like McSweeney's, which is the one that Dave yeah, Eggers started. Yeah. 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 I love um, so yeah, I've got a lot of experience up and down the board, you know, more than 20 books. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I really think that, um, the hardest thing for an author right now, and, and this is something my agent says every time I talk to him, is there's just not that many places to sell your books. And so if you don't like the terms that are being offered by your publisher, Chances are they're the same as the other three publishers, the other three major publishers. But if they're not, and the other the other publisher has slightly different terms, won't take your book, isn't interested, you're out of options. And, you know, there's a bit of solidarity opportunity here because if you're a, an editor and you don't like your working conditions, there's only three other employers for you, too. And so, you know, they, there's, there's a degree of solidarity here between writers and editors. What do you get from using a publisher that you don't get self-publishing? Is there something, it used to the, be they'd get you in bookstores. I don't think that matters anymore. I think that matters a lot. There's a lot oh, of hand selling. Okay. Yeah. And then the publicity and PR and just the best use of my time. So I did a short story collection called uh, With a Little Help uh, that Frank did the cover for. Uh, that did pretty well. I mean, uh, short story collections are not going commercial concerns. Uh, the most short story collections draw advances of, you know, a couple thousand dollars and sell a couple thousand copies. They're not, they're not a big deal. It's not a major moneymaker, although it's a thing I quite love and buy a lot of and, and read a lot of. And so with this one, I made about $30,000. Um, but it took me as much time as I would have spent writing a novel that would have made me mid six figures. Right. So it just wasn't, it wasn't worth it. Right. right? It, right. it would, it was a, it was a lot of work for a modest amount of money. Whereas I could have done, uh, the same amount of work and gotten a much larger amount of money and, you know, paid for a year of my kid's college tuition. That's a, it's a little disappointing to me because, uh, you know, one of the promises of the internet rev revolution was to eliminate the gatekeepers, to give everybody their, the chance to publish, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a blog, a book, a record. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, the, I think back to what Brianna was saying earlier, I think the people who were early advocates for internet freedom get a lot of stick, some of it fair, some of it not, about not pondering the whether just connecting everyone to the internet yeah. would be good for it. Yeah. I, you know, I think people like, people don't start organizations like EFF if they, if they think it'll all be fine. So I think that, you know, there were certainly some people who were worried about the long-term consequences. But what I think we all did miss was that antitrust law was dead. You know, yeah. that, that Reagan, the last, the last hurrah of antitrust law was breaking up AT&T in 1982. Microsoft with 95% of the operating system could not be broken up. Um, and, you know, it, it, it just went downhill from there. And now, you know, the web is five giant websites filled with screenshots of text from the other four. And it's, it's not, it's not because that was inevitable. It's because we took a policy choice to allow firms to grow by buying their competitors and by using access to the capital markets to do predatory pricing to prevent third parties from entering the market. And as a consequence, they were able to build up these things that venture capitalists call the kill zone, which is all of the businesses that big tech is in and all the businesses next to those businesses. And no one will invest in those. I, I do think it's worth saying it's not just, you know, it's not just the internet where you've seen this uh, kind of tech idealism come forward and, you know, say, oh, like, look at, look at, you know, the open internet, right? Something I strongly believe in, but you know, you're like, oh, this is going to democratize information and kind of look at things today and it's worse. And, you know, we said this about the financial industry and, oh, once we get these brokerages out of the way and, mm -hmm. you know, people can buy stocks one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to be so much better. We're going to democratize uh, wealth creation across the world. And you look at, you know, the way they do it with uh, 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 Biden, what is it called? Uh, Biden Robin Hood. Flow. Yeah, Robin Hood, yeah. all these forces. Wage inequality is getting worse. You look at the game industry. It's like when Steam came out, you're like, oh, 
oh, now we're not going to be tied to these publishers and we can buy a game from wherever and indie people can come forward and make games whenever they want. And we look at how much, you know, smaller B-level games are made to, are making today as well as indie publishers. And, oh, actually the entire system is getting worse. So I'm just saying there's a pattern of us oh, looking yeah. into things and thinking about very idealistically. Fast forward 10 years later and everything, like the kitchen's on fire. So I'm just and, saying- and what what I would say is that's completely right. And I would go even further and say that it's not just that we failed to understand that this would happen in tech, but that it would happen across the board as a result of not enforcing antitrust law, which is why there's four giant shipping companies who no one can regulate, which means that when they just try to realize economies of scale by building bigger and bigger ships, mm -hmm. eventually one of them gets stuck in the Suez Canal. And when that happens, they socialize the losses and they privatize those gains. And, you know, we have one company that makes all the eyeglasses in the world. And they also own every eyeglass retailer and the largest lens manufacturer, which makes more than half the lenses and the largest insurer. It's a, a, an Italian French conglomerate called Luxottica Essilor. And there's like one cheerleading league that is price gouging every cheerleader. And there's one wrestling league. And there's two brewers and there's two spirits companies. Uh, and there's, you know, four giant finance companies that are able to structure whole economies. It's across the board. And so, you know, I, I again, back to this thing, what did tech miss? I think the thing that tech missed is the thing that a lot of us missed, which is that when we removed the... Um, when we remove the things that stopped firms from growing by access to the capital markets, we created a dynamic where if rich people would give you money, um, you could just end up owning a whole market and no one would compete with you. And rich people like that idea because once you did own the whole market, you could extract monopoly rents from your customers and monopoly mm. concessions from your suppliers. Monopoly rents is uh, every economist's favorite phrase, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you kind of, when you, at Crunchbase, we're covering all of this. Uh, any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I got, I, got a, I got a barrel of thoughts. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. question is kind of where, where to start. I mean, I, I think that mostly I agree with what uh, our fine co-panelists are saying. I do think that centralization um, of corporate power is an issue. The thing that I get sad about is just the fact that there seems to be absolutely no redress for it yeah, because Congress is effectively owned yeah. by different corporate interests. And um, mm -hmm. it's an embarrassment to the system. However, uh, and I'll just say this again, I, I am a capitalist and I don't see a better way to organize things other than fighting back as best we can against centralized corporate power and against uh, the perversion of uh, democracy by money. In fact, if so you are I, a capitalist, that's what you want. Right? No, I don't think so. I, I think that wanting to have a market-based economy doesn't inherently make you a rapacious asshat. Can I say that on the show? I was going to say rules. Sorry. You I, can absolutely way, um, say rapacious asshat. Say it again. <laughs> uh, no, you, you did it for me. And, and Corey earlier said, uh, marry, keep, kill, which I thought was a really good form of self-censorship there. That was fantastic. Um, the, the issue is we have, we have done a good job describing the problem that impacts a lot of how our world works. But I don't think any of us have a way of, of breaking the logjam of power that we would need to to actually, for example break AWS off of Amazon, yeah. right? That should be a relatively easy one. It, it is a yeah. distinct business that is supportive and related, but distinct. And yet it's never going to happen. And so, so I that think, will allow them- I think you've missed Please. the main event. We've got Lena Khan. We've got Tim Wu. We've got changes to the DOJ, you know, Cantor. And, and we have got more trust busters in yeah. positions where they can do stuff than ever before. And we have a, a, a somewhat bipartisan consensus on this. I, admittedly, I think the Republican side of this is pretty um, selective and instrumental, right? I think that like, if they would just promise that algorithms would promote, you know, Trump content forever, uh, then, then, you know, they would lay off Facebook and Twitter and they'd be done with it. But, you know, the, 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 there is like, there are six amazing focused structural reform bills going through Congress. The best one is the Access Act. The Digital yep. Markets Act is in the trilogues in the European Union. Uh, even the Chinese cyberspace law uh, breaks up big companies, requires them to allow interoperability, and also prohibits them from blocking interoperability, uh, yep. which is also something in the DMA. 
I, it's it's pretty dope. I'm going to a, I'm going to a conference in Brussels that Charles Rover Associates is putting on at the end of the month that um, with a bunch of these people, including like Vestager, who's running this in Europe. And, um, you know, they're, Charles River Associates are the 900-pound gorilla, the monopolist, if you will, of providing economic support to antitrust cases. And, you know, they're, they've figured out which way the wind is blowing. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and to be clear, like, I, do I want to have cautious optimism? Absolutely. Am I encouraged by what you've said? Yes. Am I watching similar things? Absolutely. I, I've met Tim Wu's. Lovely. Yeah. Do I think we went to elementary to school have... together? Did you really? Are you serious? We played D and D together when we were like ten years old. The author yeah. of the kill switch. What is Tim's role yeah. now in the Biden administration? He's running antitrust for the White House. Wow. Tech antitrust for the White House. And of course, Lena Khan yeah. is the chair of the FTC. Thirty-two years old, only a little yeah. older than Alex. It's pretty impressive. And, yeah. Well, yeah. Alex, and go on. I think. Well, I just want to point out that Lena Khan's thirty-two. Taylor Swift is thirty-two, and I'm thirty-two, mm. and um, that makes me mm. want to cry in my sleep. Uh, <laughs> But while while I agree with everything Corey is saying about there being positive changes at the regulatory level in terms of staffing and so forth, and there's good momentum, I'm pessimistic because I also know a lot of the people who run these major companies, how they think, and they really don't think that there's any issue with how they do business. And they are going to fight like hell to hold on oh, to sure. their ability to extract monopoly rates. And I think they're going to win. And I, I, I'm not happy about that. I'm not trying to be like a woohoo pessimist, but I'm that's where so I'm I gonna- sit based on my view of the money. I want to plug a book called uh, The History of the Standard Oil Company by Ida M. Tarbell, who Ida Tarbell was the first woman to get a science degree in America. She was a self-taught muckraking journalist, the daughter of a Pennsylvania oilman who was ruined by John D. Rockefeller and who serialized a two-volume history of the Standard Oil Company, which is Rockefeller's oil monopoly, in the early part of this century that led to the breakup of Standard Oil. Um, and if you want to get a historic perspective, she's a brilliant writer, if you want to get a historic perspective on what it takes to uh, to actually like change the direction of that kind of industrial policy and what it looks like to live in that moment. Tarbell's book is amazing. And there's there's a really good uh, LibriVox free recording if you like audiobooks of it, uh, just a volunteer read it. Uh, and it's in the internet archive as well. And I also advise looking up the editorial cartoons because at the time uh, Rockefeller hated Tarbell, called her Tar Barrel, and there were all these editorial <laughs> cartoons of Ida Tarbell in like a dress with a bustle with her hair up, and and John D. Rockefeller is a mighty tree, and she's got an axe and she's chopping the tree down. <laughs> it's there. It's 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 amazing. Like we've been here before, almost exactly yeah. a century ago, and and you know it's not a lost art. It's not like building pyramids with uh, without without power tools, right? Like we. We actually know how to build an antitrust system. And I tell you what, the, the, the people who fancy themselves uh, industry giants today compared to Rockefeller, they're pikers. And if we brought him down, yeah. we can bring them down. Well, okay, and well, Alex, let, the thing you liked about the good old days of computing was very much that there were there were there was competition. There was a variety. There were innovations. There weren't any big dominant companies. Uh, shutting it down. And uh, that's what was so exciting about it. Right? We need to have a list uh, eventually. Someone needs to do a blog of all the books Corey's recommended because each time he brings up a book, I'm like, oh. We'll put and this then in the I show notes. It. We'll put links. Yeah, LibriVox.org, The History of Standard Oil, Volume 1 and 2, Ida M. Tarbell. That's the latest. Yeah. yeah. Let's take a little break. I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and then we should talk about the framework. And then we're going to give the framework a pl the plug it deserves. Uh, so great to have you on, Corey. Uh, Pluralistic.net is his uh, website. Uh, you've got to read all of his books. Uh, we are going to be doing, as I mentioned, Unauthorized Bread uh, in the uh, Club Twit uh, book club, Stacey Higginbotham. We actually had a vote, Corey. Uh, you and several other very, very good Books, pluralistic. I mean, uh, unauthorized bread won handily. Everybody wanted to do that. Oh, so, that's yeah, lovely. we're very excited about that. And uh, I think everybody went out and bought a copy on audible.com. No, they didn't. No, they didn't no. actually, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, also with us uh, from TechCrunch, wonderful to have a young person's perspective. Little Alex Wilhelm. <laughs> we got to we got to get an actual young person up. Because when no, I joined, we got, we got Micah. Team, like, we got Micah. He's 29. How old's that's not young enough. You need a Zoomer who can tell you about TikTok. Like, I'm serious. Like, I'm not even really kidding. Like, if I count as young, guys, we have a Harley Davidson problem. Um, all right. Both kinds, country and Western. <laughs> I will look for a young person. Uh, if I can find one, I'll see you in my Rolodex. Uh, <laughs> is, 
Taylor Swift's not, no. Uh, also with us, Brianna Wu. Always glad to have the ageless Brianna <laughs> Wu uh, on the show. Executive Director Rebellion Pack does what? Uh, we work on getting uh, progressive uh, candidates elected to office and helping the Democratic Party reach voters that we don't talk to enough. Nice. I guess they have to be Democrats. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not really interested in the Republican Party. <laughs> no, I guess they can't. We need a yes. third, maybe a third way. I don't know. Maybe that's. Maybe that's the. Corey, problem. can you please list 500 books to explain why third parties don't work? In the <laughs> okay. Okay. That's good. Why good. doesn't Corey fair, run fair for point. office? There we fair go. Point. Yeah. I'm not a U.S. citizen. He can't he fix can't, that first. He can't vote, Plus, folks. I'm also Corey I'm also Ready more Player of player one is listed as the person that runs the entire internet. I'm the president <laughs> of the Ready Oasis, Player yeah. <laughs> but but no, I'm I'm more of an outside the tent pissing in guy than an inside the tent pissing pissing out guy. I'm the last one you want running for yeah, office. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah same. Yeah. <sighs> Our show today brought to you by Linode. With Linode, you get 100% human free telephone support available worldwide. 24-7, 365. I start with that right out of the box because so many cloud services, cloud providers, there's no one home. It's a Python script. Linode's the real deal. And they've been around for a long time. I, I got my first Linode server, must be more than 10 years ago. Their award, and I've the support has always been great. Their award-winning support team. Just a highly trained team of service professionals dedicated to finding solutions while providing an unparalleled customer experience. Say no to bad customer service. Experience the Linode difference. Proudly independent. Their mission drives them to a different standard. The customer is the driving force behind everything they do. If you are looking for a cloud, I hey, you, get onto this cloud. They pioneered cloud computing back in 2003. This was three years before Amazon's web services. They have been here a long time, and they have learned, and they know they've got the experience, the expertise. The pay as you go, predictable, transparent pricing, no tiers, no buckets. Linode pioneered the predictable flat pricing model for cloud computing. So you don't have to worry about egress pricing and all of that. No more anxiety over hidden costs. It couldn't be easier to launch in the cloud and scale in the cloud. And with Linode, you get flat pricing across every global data center. You get this really nice intuitive cloud manager. They have a fantastic full-featured API, best-in-class documentation, and, again, award-winning support from actual human beings. Linode makes it easy to manage your applications in the cloud. And... You know, just because they've been around since 2003, don't think they don't know what they're doing. Proven, secure, reliable, enterprise-grade infrastructure, 11 data centers worldwide, and extensive peering relationships, their next-generation network, the modern infrastructure and performance you need to innovate at scale, whether it's hosting your website, building your app, storing or backing up your media. It's great for launching and enriching developer applications, CI, CD, hosted services, websites, AI, and machine learning workloads. You can launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. You could choose shared and dedicated compute instances. In fact, we're going to give you a $100 credit you could use on S3-compatible object storage, managed Kubernetes. According to G2 Crowd, last year Linode was rated the easiest to use that's that great interface they've got. That's why cloud developers choose Linode because they make managing complex cloud infrastructure easy. Simple bundled pricing, a full featured API, real 100% human support Linode. Get the cloud support experience you deserve. L-I-N-O-D-E. Linode, no tears, no handoffs, $100 credit waiting for you. All you have to do is go to Linode dot com slash twit l-i-n-o-d-e dot com slash twit hundred dollars goes a long way if you're looking for a great place to put your stuff linode dot com slash twit i can vouch for it i just think they're the greatest uh we had a fun week this week on twit we have managed to put it all together into a simple 60 second enjoyable short film watch 
As I got the new uh, S22 Ultra, I said, now who do I know has floppy wrists? <laughs> and it was, I have this vision. Just, just flop it around. Stacy <laughs> lifts her phone up, she's just going to topple she's over. Gonna fall over. <laughs> she's a little wisp of a lass. Previously on Twit. Tech News Weekly. What if you could have a Nintendo Switch that is also a PC? Ooh. And so that is what this Ooh. Steam Deck is. And I almost just hit myself in the face with it. It's <laughs> Which wouldn't be too pounds. difficult because it's gigantic. It's big. <laughs> iOS Today. Rosemary Orchard and I walk you through a bunch of Apple's health and safety features on all sorts of Apple's devices. On our first episode of This Week in Space, Tarek Malik from Space.com and myself, Rod Pyle, talk about atomic rockets. You know, when you compare these to chemical rocket engines, the longest the, the rocket engines ever ran in the Apollo program were a matter of minutes. Atomic engines could run for hours. And this would cut transit times to Mars by as much as possibly 50%. Twit. Learn something new every day and what it means. Of course, you'll be plastered to the seat. <laughs> that is our newest show launched uh, Friday, uh, this week in space with uh, Rod Pyle and uh, Tarek Malik. And I'm thrilled to have it on because there is a there has not been a more exciting time to talk about space. Uh, they are audio only. They are audio only. We showed you some video, but don't get your hopes up. Uh, honestly... It was a huge mistake to do video. It's ridiculously expensive. Uh, the facelifts alone have cost me a mint. Uh, so we're just going to, from now on, it's all audio uh, for anything new. Old shows, we can't take away the video because you'll get mad at us, right? Um, framework. Framework? Framework. Yeah. Framework. Framework. Uh, I just, I just, this is kind of part of a right to repair thing, a DIY thing. These are laptops. Look inside. They have QR codes on all the parts. So you scan them. It brings you to the website. You can buy a replacement. Uh, you can also do your own. One of our uh, Club Twit members, uh, Galia, has clear keycaps, which make mm -hmm. me crazy because how do you know what key is what? <laughs> but she likes it. Um, you can add RAM. I decided, because these modules, these little, you see them here, these little modules are really just USB type C. Uh, there are third party making modules. I decided, I bought an HDMI module when I first got it and I thought, I'm never going to use this. So I bought a, a terabyte uh, SSD for backup on it. It's there. And that, and Corey, I think it's interesting that you say, given that you've been using these you know, great Lenovo keyboards, that this is the best laptop you've ever used. Yeah. I mean, I miss the track point. I, I, I won't lie. And I miss having hardware buttons. And I've actually, um, because I, because I've learned on hardware buttons where, and so I, my, that's how my fingers remember where they are. I can never find them. So I've actually used a little piece of Sugru to make <laughs> a middle button on my trackpad so that I can always find my, my, my trackpad. So I got a little like, uh, it's like FIMO dough, right? A little, little clay stuck on bit. So I can always find my middle button. Otherwise I, my middle that's clicks hysterical. are all messed up. That's but apart hysterical. from that, I love this machine. Uh, so it's, it's the size of a MacBook. Um, in fact, you know, I, I, I had the it's three by two, over. which is actually better than a MacBook. I like the three yeah, by okay. two aspect ratio, but yeah, I had Mark Fraunfelder over for, for, uh, you know, gathering in the backyard and he was like, have you switched back to a Mac? Cause it's been mm -hmm. 15 years since I switched to Linux. And, mm -hmm. he, and I was like, no, this is my new, you know, easily opened, easily updated. So there's six captive screws on the bottom. It, it ships with this little spudger screwdriver tool. Um, you open the six captive screws and then the, the back just peels off. Uh, and then your, your, the entire machine is exposed as you can see there on the screen share. Um, and, uh, like, honestly, I, so I swapped the hinges super easy. I, you know, it came as a bag of parts when I bought it cause that was the fastest way to get it. So I had to install the Ram, the Wi-Fi card, the uh, hard drive. It was all dead easy. There's the only thing tricky was that uh, antenna for the Wi-Fi card. Yeah, the Wi-Fi antenna connectors. Yeah. The, the, there's a no tool battery replacement procedure. So like when your battery dies, you just, it's like a 10 that. minute thing. I love um, that. The bezel is magnetically clipped on. It's so as you can see there in that video, you just literally just press the bezel into place and it's done. Yeah. Um, 
And so I I, I got the uh, safety orange replacement bezel, and I've got that <laughs> on there. I actually uh, it's got it's got a hardware cutoff switch for the uh, mic and camera that also acts as a shutter cover. Love so that too. The, yeah. Yeah. When you slide that over it, it covers it. And then I managed to knock it over on its face so that I drove the shutter cover into the into yeah. the webcam lens and broke the webcam. I break everything. And so I did I got to do a webcam replacement, which again, it was like an eight dollar part and it took me three minutes. Doesn't it make you, know, you feel it, better too that you could just you just do that? It makes you feel so accomplished. So confident. I'm actually thinking of adding a bag of parts to my travel bag. Yeah. In and, case. And just like if I break stuff, I'll just fix it on the road. You Do know? they? So you're obviously in touch with these guys. Where are they located? I don't even know. Oh, I mean, know. you know, they're located in the in their in parts the arrive internet. in my mailbox. Yeah. So you know, they're <laughs> located they, on the internet. Are they going to upgrade, for instance, the motherboard and maybe put? They new say so. Yeah. Yeah, they say that. You know, I mean, it's hard to to know within the con confines of what um, processor vendors will do. Uh, but, you know, looking ahead on the existing roadmaps, they think that they can just keep doing motherboard replacements until uh, they, they, yeah, and, and you know, for, for quite some time. Like, uh, assuming the, the processor swaps keep working, I don't know why I would get another laptop. Yeah. You know, like yeah. Uh, yeah. I just it's yeah. it's high quality hardware. Like I might replace different parts of it. I'd turn into oh, yeah. the ship of thesis. But I can, you know Yes, exactly. I mean you'll get a new keyboard, I'm sure, soon. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, maybe I'll get a new chassis if I manage to drop it from right. a high enough place. But then I'll keep all the parts inside the right. chassis. You know, I I mean that's that I, I have no uh qualms about replacing all the components in this and keeping it for over the long term and not having a stack of laptops that, you know, I've outgrown over the years instead just being able to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade. I am happy to give them a plug because I'm, I'm hoping that they do well. Uh, yeah, because I do want them to continue to offer parts and, and pieces and so forth. Uh, it's a really good idea. you I've seen a couple of people in negative reviews, but 99% very, very positive. And I, my experience I has been it. like yours. I love it. Every day I open it up, I go, yeah. And I'm running Manjaro uh, Linux on it. The key, uh, the fingerprint reader works out of the box with Manjaro right. Linux. It's wonderful. I type SUDO and I can use the, the key, uh, you know, the fingerprint reader to, to do my uh, commands. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's really I, nice. I, I just saw today, so the, the, I, you have to run the latest, you had to run the latest Ubuntu, which is not the long-term supported version, a long-term support version to get the fingerprint reader and the Wi-Fi card. And they just updated the LTS version so that if you get one of those LTS versions that are guaranteed for four years now, it just works out of the yeah. box. Manjaro so, worked it, out of the box. I think I had to modify a config file or something, but that I don't, I'm... I don't. I much prefer rolling releases, so I'm not an Ubuntu fan. But um, it worked beautifully, and it's still working. I'm running uh, BTRFS with that and Time Shift, so I get uh, I little get little um, uh, uh, you know cat snapshot backups, and mm -hmm. it's just the thing is incredible, incredible. Yeah, I love it. As I'm an really Apple person, I'm sitting here listening to this conversation. Well, it really makes you wonder so why sad. doesn't well, Apple could do this. They, they no. will never do but it. They were lucky for the Apple Silicon last generation. They actually made it thick enough that the keyboard works again. Like, it feels like, like it feels like somebody has gotten into Apple and said, you know, you really should have more ports on there. You really yeah, don't maybe need a you touch should have bar. a keyboard maybe that doesn't a keyboard break that, after yeah. a, a month. Yeah, so it maybe feels like you should have that uh, era is over port. of like glue everything in thinner and 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 put in yeah. So maybe maybe. Like, I, I hope, hope so, but yeah, I mean, hearing you guys talk watching. about this, it just makes me realize everything that I've This is how up. gear should be. Yes. All gear should be like this. Uh, and your yeah. battery dies, 59 bucks. You take it out, put in a new one, and you're done. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I, for the longest time, the story from, from Apple was, well, we, we could make these things more environmentally sustainable, but then they'd be seven inches thick and they would weigh not, 16 and now pounds. Now we know and, that's not true. You know, yep. The keyboard would be in Cyrillic or something. <laughs> and, you know, like, it's just, it's just not true. Yeah, we know that. I didn't realize you could get a safety orange bezel, though. That's tempting. Yeah. <laughs> Why safety do you orange have that? Is the best color. Because <laughs> it's the best color. Everything, everything's better in safety orange. I've been trying to convince my wife to let me paint the bedroom safety orange. There's, there's this, there's this British chain of... Um, yeah. There's this, there's this British chain of emergency plumbers called Dino Rod, and their vans are painted the most amazing safety orange. And I'm like... 
a- any kind of clothing that is in Dino Rod Orange, I'm like, if, is it a my size? Because if it is, I'm buying it, you know? I have... Uh, this is, you know, before the show, Alex was saying, you know, just to let you know, I haven't read every story in the rundown. I have literally a hundred more stories that we could cover, but we're we're up almost at three hours. I think this would be yeah. a good time to say good night to our esteemed team. I would love to do this show all night, all day, but I know they have lives, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna let you go. You guys are fantastic, uh, Brianna Wu. You look beautiful. You're getting better. Your throat, you sounded fine. I'm so thrilled. Rebellionpack.com. What do you plug something? Anything? Uh, come listen to us on Rocket. Rocket. Uh, we actually, this week, we had the dropout, which is the Elizabeth Holmes show. Um, we got exclusive access, not exclusive, but we got uh, advanced access to the entire series on Hulu, uh, which is about the Elizabeth Holmes saga. Y'all, it is, it is so good. Is it, it a good show? So Should good. I watch it? It is so good. So, I watched Inventing Anna and I did not really enjoy it because they just invented stuff when they yeah. needed to have like Hollywood drama. Yeah. This is the opposite of that. They had a showrunner that acted like basically a uh, like a journalist working nice. with a journalist from Nightline. Nice. So the first episode starts off and it actually goes into Elizabeth Holmes's past. It goes into the trip where she met Sonny Balwani for the oh, first wow. time. Wow. It goes into how they started their relationship. And it's the acting is 10 out of 10. It is, it is all a hundred percent accurate. And I cannot recommend that enough. So it's kind of cool. Like, it yeah, went full yeah. circle. It was a podcast first. Yes, it started as a podcast and now it's a show. Uh we actually interviewed uh, a lot of the team behind that show on Rocket this week. So Go watch it. It's a it's really good episode. Episode three seventy five, the dropout with Rebecca Jarvis, uh, EP and the podcast uh, producer. Uh, I think yeah, that's the current one. Yeah, uh, yeah. She Christina was on Warren, yeah. Simone de Rochefort, Brianna. <laughs> I like saying that. Brianna Wu. Yeah, it's a great show. Rocket uh, on Relay at dot FM slash Rocket. And I am going to watch the dropout tonight. You got me. It's really good. It's yeah. really good. What a story. It's such a great story. Yeah, I loved Inventing Anna, but it was a guilty pleasure because I knew I was being suckered. Right, because the entire time, like, they literally have a, a template when the show's playing. It says everything here is real except, except the parts what's made we up. really made yeah, up. Yeah. It's like, okay. I mean, I get how that's is trashy and fun TV, but I, I'm more interested in the facts of what happened. And you know, who's great though just, is Julia yeah. Garner is. Amazing. Oh, she's 10 out of 10. I love such Ozark. a great actor. She made, yeah, the, and, if it weren't for her, I think I might've been frustrated by the show, but she was on, you couldn't stop watching. It was incredible. Yeah. We had Rachel Deloche uh, Williams also, who's Rachel on Inventing Anna, the, oh. the woman that got scammed over. We love scams on Rocket. And just watching the way they treated her on that show really upset me because she's a she's a good, she's a better person. She than got dumped on. Credit for. She got dumped yeah. on. It was not fair. Yeah. 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 I, and I think that there opinion. was an old agenda because uh, Neff was the advisor. I think there was a little agenda going on behind the scenes. And I knew that. And so it was a guilt. I enjoyed the show. It was a guilty pleasure. I can't yeah. wait to watch the dropout. Thank you. It's good. Love you. Glad you're doing so well. It's great to see you. Thank you for being here. My young friend, <laughs> <laughs> Alex Wilhelm, <laughs> ah, yes. reporter at TechCrunch. You're doing a podcast with TechCrunch, right? Yeah, actually, Equity, um, the little show that I helped put together, is going to turn five this month. <gasps> and That's woo! awesome. Happy birthday. Yeah. I, I remember when uh, we were five, uh, about 10 years ago, seven, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> we actually just sent uh, our founding producer off to a new job. Um, oh. And so it's kind of one of those like uh, turning moments, if you will. Yeah. So I, I'm full of emotions and feels because podcasting is a very, uh, it's a very human thing. If it you, is. If, if you know what I mean. That's what I think I might. Yeah. I'm inhuman, but the show itself is very human. You are inhuman because you managed to have <laughs> no, like people people don't realize how hard it is to have like enthusiasm for multiple hours at a time. And I got here a minute early uh, just to check my sound system, and Leo was finishing his radio show. Literally got up, changed rooms, sat down, and did three hours with us. I am losing my voice though. I'm starting to, starting to sound like Brianna. So I'm uh, just very impressed that uh, you can do that. Thank with, you. Uh, with care. Thank yeah. you, Alex. I appreciate it. <laughs> 
Look, I, I'm the only smoker on the show. So like, wait a minute, you smoke cigarettes? No, I, I will. I consume vape. nicotine via chewing. You vape. Yeah. 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 My so, daughter, uh, I think, finally quit. <laughs> Look at that. I only do it when I'm off Look camera. You can't put a way, screenshot you, of... <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure like, that out. How'd that happen? All of a sudden, he's vaping. We no, stole a screenshot. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, my mother-in-law is going to find out. Oh, my God. He's got like a plume of smoke. His head is hidden in this... <laughs> Jeez, Louise, this cloud of, of I, glycerin and water and nicotine just all over you. I, I come on to it to be to be bullied, but I do have one final comment, which is about uh, something Corey was talking about, which is him breaking everything. And I just want to say that I thought I was the only klutz in the world of technology mm. because I drop everything. <laughs> I drop phones, laptops, monitors. My my good camera that I'm not using today falls off my desk all the time. I, I just break stuff, and I thought it was just me. Turns out there's two of us at least, so <laughs> I feel a lot better. The tech industry thanks you. Yeah. Alex Wilhelm, I thank you. Have a great evening. Give my love to your beautiful wife. I will. And uh, I hope you enjoy my childhood home. As always, keep yep. taking care of it. Yeah, yeah, you are. Much better care than we took. Corey did, may not know this, but Alex lives literally in my childhood home in Providence. Right I now. had gathered what? that. From, from <laughs> what? I thought at first you were speaking uh, poetically, no, but no, then no, I no, literally realized. That he's built how that, did that, he's built how that did silly that building where I used to hang out in the backyard there. How yeah, did it happen? More, it's a weird story. It's a long, weird, it, just coincidence. It, it, yeah, coincidence. I, my my spouse, Brianna, is from uh, Providence, and we're here because she's a, a doctor, and this is where her residency is, and we um, we live in the house that it turns out, by freak of nature, that it happens to be where Leo grew up. It's it's We've made some changes, wow. but like, it's the same. Yeah. Small world, right? That's, that's there, bizarre. You wow. should have been yes. here when we figured that out. Because Liza's wow. here, Alex and Liza were here, and we were talking about Providence. And I said, I grew up in Providence. She said, where? I said, the street. She said, what number? And I said, the number. And she said, that's my house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so it's literally, there's, there's two I, I, Providences, right? There's Hasbro Providence and there's RISD Providence. Which Providence RISD are you Providence. in? RISD Providence. Uh, RISD, okay. Oh, RISD, no, RISD no. Providence. The east side where all the old houses are. That house was built in 1806, yep. um, and it, it, we got it. It was a shell in 19, I want to say 66, and my folks fixed it up, made it nice, got the plaque on it that you get if you restore it to its original state. Which we still have. Yeah. Yeah, you still have the plaque then, on it? Oh, good. Yeah, well, but the plaque's actually the dining room, so we need to, we, there's a disagreement about if our shutters are um, historically accurate, which I don't think oh, people man, are they, tell me what I do Are they shutters. finicky? We had oh, to have insane. paint from that era, 1806 paint. I mean, the whole thing. Yeah. Very finicky. Lead paint or nothing. <laughs> Lead paint or nothing, I baby. Wanted, I wanted to have fluorescent orange house paint. Yeah, no. uh, and I was Safety told orange is not, was not from that era. That is <laughs> Corey Doctor, who's wearing the best shirt of the year, of the decade. Uh Corey, is uh, craphound.com still around? Yes, you still... Yeah, that's where you can buy my books and then and get my podcast and then pluralistic.net's where you find my stuff. Wait a minute, and what's the podcast about? Oh, it's just me reading my stuff. I've been doing it since 2006. Oh, you read your books. Yeah, 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 yeah. I read my books and stories yeah. and essays and yeah. I recorded one this afternoon before I got on with you guys nice. and actually uploaded it while we were talking. So it went live while we were talking here. The Tax Surface, uh, uh, the most recent sci-fi book, How to Destroy Surveillance Capitalism, the most recent. Yep. Paul, this is one of the smartest guys in the Aww. world. And, uh, and and I would say that if you're looking for something for me to plug, I'm nearly done now. Uh, the uh, Wengrove and Graber's Rise of uh, Dawn of Everything. Uh, David, David. Oh, I'm uh, reading that too. You love oh that? Oh my God, it's so good. Yeah. I mean, Graber, he coined the term, you know, we are the 99% and he wrote Bullshit Jobs and he wrote um, uh, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, a really incisive anthropologist, anti-authoritarian. And then Wengrove, his his collaborators are really accomplished um uh, archaeologist. We we lost uh, Graber during the pandemic. He, just he died. after he finished the book. Yeah, just after finishing it. We were on a live cast together just oh. a couple of days before he died. It went so fast oh. for him. And he, but it's what a what a legacy that he's left. It is such a a challenge to the idea that there are inevitable ways that humans end up living, and that really, like the historic record, really supports that. 
there's every arrangement you can imagine has existed over extremely long timescales and relatively stable ways, including ones that would, you know, make you want to take a bath and ones that would make you think that there's no way humans could be that good and egalitarian and kind and, and anti-authoritarian. And, um, and that therefore it's a choice, right? Like there's nothing inevitable about any of our social arrangements. Um, we've had technology and then we've thrown it away. We've had technology, we've used it one way and had technology and used it a different way. Um, there's, n there's no determination about living in cities or having agriculture or having steam power or having a certain kind of metallurgy or living close to people who are different or living far from people who are different or living on a horizontal landmass or a vertical landmass. All these things that people have said inevitably determine how we live just turns out that we live however we choose to live and that, that it's really like their human agency um, is the final determinant of the caliber of our society. And it's the most hopeful message for this moment, especially. And it's so beautifully written. They're so smart, so funny, and so brilliant, so, so accomplished in their historic research. I couldn't agree more. It's just fascinating. And kind of an antidote uh, to the Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, exactly. Um, kind of uh, simplistic way of thinking. And kind of, unfortunately, there's a huge amount of bias and you, un, undetected bias in how we think about things. And uh, uh, I think Graveman really yeah. somehow magically is able to abandon that and think about stuff in a new way. And the, the other good news is that modern archaeology is really making some yeah. incredible it's Really strides. amazing. Yeah. Whole civilization, the regions that we thought never had settlements, we're finding evidence of, of settlements going back thousands of years, diff multiple different distinct civilizations with different patterns. We're able to understand a lot about them. And and that's a, I mean, it's a science and technology story, but it's also an anthropology story and an, and, and an archaeology story. It's, it's fascinating. A, yeah. Really amazing. And yeah, they take a lot of aim at, at uh, Yuval and they take a lot of aim at Stephen Pinker and at um, uh, Jared Diamond and Guns, Germs and Steel. And they just say that these these just so narratives that basically say we are in the world that we were inevitably going to be in and and kind of there's no there's no choice. And really kind of you should abandon hope of changing it, um, that those are that those are wrong, that like everything is changing. Everything is up for grabs. If you want a more perfect world and you could imagine it, we could probably make it happen. It's just a matter of figuring out how to get other people to buy into your vision. But there's no there's no inevitable collapse or no inevitable fracture line that will tear it apart. Dawn, uh, the dawn of everything. Uh, he also wrote Debt, the first 5,000 years, which I am is next on my list. Uh, Utopia of Rules, his little essay collection is so good. Yeah. There's a great essay in it about how, um, the title essay about how we used to say, oh, well, nobody wants to live in the Soviet Union because there's only like one kind of store that sells one kind of merchandise and you have to stand in long lines and you have to fill in lots of paperwork. And he's like, fast forward to, you know, the mid 2010s where the same 15 stores are in every mall and on every high street <laughs> where we're filling in more bureaucratic forms than ever. And where like even people who are way up the socioeconomic ladder are standing in three hour TSA lines and, and tell me exactly what it was that was better about this. <laughs> society it's pretty good <laughs> yeah yeah the dawn of everything thank you so much Corey. we're going to put thank together you. Corey's book list uh it's about 400 <laughs> volumes long it's okay we'll put it in our show notes uh i have there are quite a few books that you mentioned that uh, people well, should read thanks yeah. leo and yeah. it was lovely to see you both brianna own. and alex yeah. thank you thank you Corey. a pleasure thank you. thank you brianna thank you alex wow what a show huh thank you for being here you guys uh I got a very special episode, I think. We do Twit Sunday afternoons, about 2 Pacific, 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern, 22.30 UTC. I mentioned the live time because you can watch us do it live, live.twit.tv. You get the first draft of Twit. Uh, if you're watching live, you should chat live. IRC.twit.tv is open to all members of Club Twit. Also get uh, their dedicated uh, Discord, which is a great place to hang. That's where our book club is. That's where our Untitled Linux show is. Uh, the Giz Fizz. Uh, it's where we launch new shows like uh, This Week in Space. Uh, Seven dollars uh, a month. But the most important benefit is not, in theory anyway, not the Discord, not the special feeds. 
Uh, it's the ad-free versions of all our shows, ad-free and tracker-free. So if you don't want to be part of the surveillance economy, you can. You don't have to be. Uh, you can, uh, for a mere $7 a month, um, which is about what we estimate we make off of you. <laughs> well, just give us the money direct and eliminate the middleman. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. Uh, to join the club. We, we're very grateful to all of our club members. And it's a great bunch of people in that Discord. A lot of fun. After the fact, everything we do is always available for free on our website, twit.tv. Uh, you can also, uh, there's a YouTube channel for every show. Where there's a link right there on the uh, twit.tv site for that. Um, so if you want to watch the video on YouTube, you can do that. Uh, you can also subscribe on your favorite podcast client. Yes, anyone will work. Even Spotify. I don't think the BBC player works, but everything else does because uh, it's an RSS feed. And you subscribe, you get it automatically, and you support independent podcasting. And I think that's very, very important. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. Another twit. Bye-bye. Doing the twit. Doing the twit.